Sentence where people say it's great to come back, and I have to tell you it's great to come back. <laughs> like I just, I just really had such a wonderful time the last time. I think six years ago, and so of course I jumped at the chance. And in order to honor that kind of joy I have at being in Colorado, I just, I just so love it here. Uh, I'm going to try to have um, something which is particularly meta. So we're going to do a talk, and in the talk we're going to do the topic of the talk. Got it. Right. So the good, of, the good of that is it's eight o'clock in the morning. That requires we actually all sort of hop in. Um, that you, no, that's, that's, you've been warned. That's the, how this talk goes. So we, what I'm intending to do here then is take us through a kind of a romp or a ride through the sciences of learning. Um, and uh, the, the idea is to like, be, do the sciences of learning within this talk about the sciences of learning. So that's how this works. I just want to make sure I, I strongly say that while I'm having the great joy again of coming to Colorado, um, the team is back in Cambridge, Massachusetts, working. So I just, just thank them overtly. Um, I'm going to pause you for a second yeah. and just ask the Zoomers to mute their sounds, please. Thanks. We have some folks zooming in. I'm muting the Zoom. OK. Thanks. All right, guys. Hi, Zoom guys. Um, all right, and then I have no conflicts of interest or financial disclosures, except to say that I don't drink coffee, and this is like the actual me. Just kind of <laughs> all, right. all right, so we're going to start off here with um, educational science that we, that we will try to remember. Now, of course, the topic is about having people learn how to remember, so we should do it ourselves. So first, we're going to learn about test-enhanced learning. We'll learn about desirable difficulties. We will learn about the a spacing effect, spacing of learning. The interleaving effect, interleaving learning. The self theories of Carol Dweck, one of my personal favorites. And this notion of deliberate practice. Now, the list you see here, I have to do a few little reveals at the beginning. The list you see here, you will see again. Because part of the idea of learning, of course, involves seeing things again. And when you see it again, I will, I will try to engage like what the point of the return to it was and what it can do and what it cannot do for increasing memory um, and retention. So for now, there are six items on the list. And if I were really trying to be good about making sure that we animate the list, I will tell you that the first item in the list is test-enhanced learning, that is to say quizzing people. So it would be entirely inappropriate if I weren't going to quiz you at some point on this list, right? So that should, that should help you just note the list. Again, this is all sort of like a wrap and a wrap and a wrap. If I say to you that I'm going to quiz you on it, that itself helps enhance learning, whether I now quiz you or not. But I'm going to quiz you, right? Yes. All right. So there are three requirements for remembering. Just to give you a little insight into this, this is the distraction thing I do before the quiz. <laughs> but there are three requirements for remembering. There's encoding, there's storage, and there's retrieval. When you give people lists, by the way, you can give them three, four, five, six. You can't go beyond seven. For those of us who are my age or in this generation, Remember the phone numbers used to be 442-4614, seven things? Because right? humans, it, it's, it's been shown that around seven is where we start to sort of lose our, not around seven years old, around 50 years old is when you start to lose your memory, but around seven years old, um, seven numbers or seven digits, seven things, and it's harder to hold on to a list. So here's three. The previous list was six. Let's think about these three requirements for remembering. Encoding. Encoding is acquisition. It's actually putting knowledge in. Storage, of course, is persistence, holding the knowledge over time. And retrieval is being able to get it back out. We're going to talk a lot about retrieval practice as well. You can train for being able to retrieve later by training for retrieval when you first learn. Right? 
So encoding, storage, retrieval. All right, so we're back to the sex. When you are trying to have people learn things, it is good to have the thing, to have something else, and have the thing again. So we're back on the sex. We're good? It's also good to pause for about seven seconds. I'm not good at that, actually. It turns out I can't stay the seven. That, that feels so long. But, but if you pause, though, people are more likely. Because my, my talking while you're looking at this list actually is in the way of your learning. So it's better if I could say it or, or you could read it. But in either case, it's good to have some moment to try to actually acquire it. I'm going to try to avoid those pauses in the future because they drive me nuts. All right. So you got the six. All right. So first thing, here's our pretest. What are the six domains of educational science that we're going to discuss today? So what we'll do first is, just sitting there in your happy space, just hold on. See if you can, if you can hold on to remember any of the six you just saw, right? Or two of them, maybe even, or three. What you're doing, actually, is you're trying to retrieve. You're trying to sort of pull back. And retrieving matters a lot. So having chances with your learners to have them be forced to retrieve makes them more able to retrieve subsequently in the future. That, that actually builds memory, learning, and retention. But so does this. If, when you're trying to retrieve, right, you may have gotten five, you may have gotten four, whatever, it's also good to try to like, actually explicate it. The joke I always tell, and it's absolutely, absolutely true to my lived life, is that I, I had learned uh, English, you can hear it quite poorly, then I learned German, which was not of great utility, although I loved it, it was not of great utility for going to medical school or seeing patients or anything. So I get to Cambridge where we were opening a clinic in a neighborhood that we had all the research had said was going to be Salvadoran, and I had to learn Spanish. So for two years, I went and learned Spanish. Turns out the neighborhood became Brazilian by the time I was done with the Spanish. We had to speak Portuguese. <laughs> but in the meantime, I was trying to learn Spanish now as a grown-up. Um, and I can just assure you that the Spanish in my head and the Spanish out of my mouth were not the same. Right? Some people call this barroom Spanish. Like you're sitting there at the bar and you're thinking, oh, I can speak Spanish to this person. And then you try and you cannot speak Spanish to the person either because you can't speak Spanish to the person or because it's a bar. But, but, but I want to say to you that um, having this chance to turn to your neighbor and try the six is different than simply trying them in your head. So for, for learning and retention, it's good to actually have each. All right? Drawing it back for yourself does help. Uh, exchanging with another helps even more. So to grab a partner. We can do this together if you like. You grab a partner. Um, and just see if you can together get the six. they might not pay attention as much as you were. That's what I was thinking about. I was even so tempted to like, make a real life experience and, and wonder how that played out. And I think so I as soon as he said, and I agree with that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, has he been here? Yeah. Okay, it's never the CPA. Yeah. There was an interview. Right. Would help me. I only wrote that yeah. one. We even started working. I was organizing. We have got half the color. All right. So we will. We will reconvene. We will reconvene to see how to see about this. No. I guess we'll find out. I know, but aren't you curious? Yeah. Yeah, we can. I'll reconvene you guys. Me too. So we come back together here. I'm very visual in the sense of I need to. 
Yeah, right. Ah, you're mourning people here because they're... Can I keep kind of picture? We're like real medical students. I went to Epsomet, so that's fantastic. And I knew there's parts of it. All right, learners and learners alike. Because I was thinking about that. Touchdown, thumbs up. You guys ready? All right. So the pretest test is first to try to, to draw them back yourself inside your head, try to do the retrieval pathway, then to do something involving social learning or out the out of the mouth moment, right? And if you then obviously if you hadn't been able to get six, we can keep doing this until you can make your make your list. So um, as we go forth, okay, be assured the six will arrive again, right? And we will talk about that and be assured maybe that it could even please you again, all right? So, all right, does anybody want to offer one of the six? Just enhanced learning. Test enhanced learning. <laughs> you, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely excellent. And we'll get into that quite deeply. Any another one? Spacing. Spacing. Spacing of learning. Learn and then a space of time and then we learn. Excellent. Yeah. A third one? Deliberate practice. Deliberate practice, indeed. So this we're gonna get into sort of what it means to have practice with coaching, with getting corrected as you go. Desirable Believing. difficulties. But desirable difficulties. <laughs> Too easy is not right. Too hard is not right. There's some amount of hard which helps. Perfect. Interleaving. Interleaving, like like a, like a deck of cards being sort of uh, folded into each other, pages of a book folded into each other. Interleaving, mixing what you learn and self theories and of the Carol Dweck. Self theories of Carol Dweck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which is like, which is a complicated but absolutely brilliant, brilliant topic, which we'll get into too. Excellent. Now, there's something to be said also for Socratic querying. So I'm going to use the expression Socratic querying because I was just part of a paper recently where we're trying to get rid of a particular term, which I will not say, um, that, that has to do with sort of mean, mean questioning. The term has got to, as a feminist, the term has to go away. And we can, if you want to ask someone what that means, we'll get into it later. Um, but yeah, Socratic querying, though, is perfectly fine. And it has to be, though, like the actual Socrates, which means that when you're, when you're querying or questioning people, it has to be out of the full passion of caring about them, right? You're not questioning for yourself. You're not questioning to shame, you're questioning for the joy of learning and because you want to serve the other. So we'll, I'll do some Socratic querying as well. All right, there are the six. Now, interestingly, you've seen the six things three times already. That you, that you now see the same list in the same order with the same words means what you're not doing is a desirable difficulty. Because as soon as you saw the list again, your brain did this. It said, I've seen that list before, and it no longer like deeply tries to attend to maybe the one or the two that you weren't as good at drawing back yourself, right? So this idea of like, it's sort of like fake familiarity, right? You, it's, it looks like the list, it's the list, and you don't do the hard work anymore of actually saying like, oh my gosh, I forgot the self theories. Okay, what the heck is a self theory, right? So I'm gonna warn you that when you, just because you repeat something, doesn't mean you're actually repeating it in an effective way. So I did that as a, as a warning. But let's get into these uh, in a different way. I'm gonna go through each in turn now for the, for the remainder of the talk. And I'm gonna try to do these in multimodal ways. We'll do some kind of sciencey stuff where I can show you that the actual data um, but I'm also going to try to use images as well, because it may be that the, wor the words are not the best way for you to hold the idea. Maybe my little, my kind of quippy explanations or little stories are not the best way for you to hold the idea. Maybe just seeing some images is the best way to hold the idea. So for, for test-enhanced learning, I'm in complete agreement, right? It has to do with this notion of maybe like flashcards. The idea that there's something that, oh, what is the answer to that? And you would sort of get the answer. For desirable difficulties, we have to do the, the brains have to do the hard work of learning. So we'll have this little brain lifting the weights. For space, I just made that, the open Colorado road, right? Okay. So those mountains are not nearly high enough um, for, for even the front range, but whatever. You get the idea. So that there's this long space, and you can learn, have some time, and then relearn. Interleaving, multiple things simultaneously, or the sort of mixing of things. You see the image? The interesting question, could I show you the images then later and have you remember what the notion was? Yeah. The self theories of Carol Dweck showing her book cover. I'm doing that because you love the book. The book is absolutely brilliant. But that's actually not helpful to know what the self theories are. So I'm just showing the book for a second and then the, the image that I want you to remember. Can you, what's, what's this image of? Falling off a horse. Falling off a horse. And the notion would be then that get you should on it, get, get back up on the horse, yes. And I'm playing a little bit of Western themes here. I recognize that. So. <laughs> right. Which, parenthetically, is something you also should do when teaching. Should I tap into where the audience is? Right, so. And finally, um, deliberate practice. Right? You see here the person learning the piano, but you also see here the coach doing the correcting. So it's not just practice. It's practice with corrections happening. All right, 
Those are our six. Now, what we should do now each in turn. So test enhanced learning, one of my favorites too. Sometimes referred to as the testing effect. Sometimes referred to as testing for learning. In order to retain, you do quizzing. You should think about flashcards. That's the image we're going to do. And you should think about the Socratic query and the Socratic methods, asking people an answer. Now, of course, there's something to know when you're, when you're quizzing another person. You can, I can quiz somebody, but, but, but we can quiz ourselves as we go. Like, we can quiz ourselves in real time. Like, for example, right now, you could say, gosh, what were those six? Like, you can do these sort of trying to quiz and draw back as you go. If you do quiz yourself in real time, that would be, for example, you read a page of a book, and you kind of cover it up and think, okay, I think what the author was saying there was, right? If you do that in real time, you tend to learn substantially more. And there's lots of reasons. It's not just that you're quizzing yourself. It also creates a desirable difficulty, that you're slowing down. But I, would, I just want to say that as you're hearing things, it's good to have some space to try in real time to see, like, do I get that? Like, what? I think what he's saying, what she's saying is, right? So think of quizzing oneself or being quizzed. All right. So I, I made this pictorially as well. One can quiz another. One can respond, yes. One also can quiz another person to train that person to quiz themselves. So it's, it's a great thing for educators to be able to put into another the habit of mind to self-quiz as they go. <laughs> Just to be sort of ridiculous about this. Think about the, the kind of wonderful educator that would be that would tell others to quiz themselves as they go. Okay, again, I'm, I'm calling myself. All right. All right. But, but what I'm saying to you is, it, it, authentically, if you actually, it, it is an important thing to do. So whatever you care about infectious diseases, it's really important that the people who are learning ID are quizzing as they go. They will learn more ID that way. Right. All right. So this is the, what we're going to get at, is the idea of quizzing oneself or, or being um, desirous of being quizzed. All right. So let's go, into the, let's go into the science. Now, I want to say one thing. There is extraordinarily interesting and maybe even true education theory out there, but I don't want to have this morning spent together thinking about educational theory. Theory is great. I want to get into like, the empirically derived educational sciences, which was the name of the talk, after all. So we're going to go through things that have been demonstrated with good, with good hard, like we would hold it to our own standards of science. One of the original and really kind of fun papers, um, uh, Rudiger and Karpiki, I believe they were, I think, maybe at WashU at the time. Yeah, they were at WashU at the time. Um, did sort of brought us this notion of test-enhanced learning by uh, subjecting undergrads to the following experience. So there were 120 undergraduates in this early experiment. You see the ages. And they were put into two groups of 60. And in each group of 60, the undergrads, in each group, they had one of two uh, prose passages. So one of the passages was about dolphins and was about the sun, I think. They were just things to learn. And you see the length of the passages. So one of the two groups that got the two passages... Um, would have this situation where they would study the material, have five minutes of distraction. I think it was math they would do for five minutes. And then they did study the material again. They had the exact same passage back. They would know that they were going to be quizzed later. Study, have a distraction, study again, and they would be quizzed subsequently. The other group with the same two passages would study the material, um, and then they would have a, this distraction for five minutes, and then there'd be a blank paper. Please write down all you knew, all you remember from that thing you just read. So they're forced into this retrieval, this drawback, right, of knowledge. And of course, they were tested on the material at five minutes, at two days, and at one week. So the group that studied and restudied outperformed the group that studied and got the blank paper at five minutes, which we should just say out loud means that cramming actually has a benefit. It has a benefit at five minutes or in a very short time frame after you cram, right? So I, I wanted to say that if you think, well, if cramming has a benefit, so people should cram if the goal is to do well on that test that's forthcoming tomorrow. But that should be not confused with what the data show, which is that even two days later, those who had to do the drawback pass, the, the retrieval practice, retain more. And a week later, they retain more. And in perpetuity, they retain more. And it's a significant difference with reasonable effect size. So hmm, that, that intrigued them, this idea that the blank paper somehow fostered longer-term retention, even though cramming still has some merit. They, they went again, round two. There were three groups of 60 students, 100, 180 students, three groups of 60. They again had, these are new students, they, they again had two passages, one about the sun, one about dolphins, you can see the length. And in the first group, um, one group got the, the material, five minutes of distraction, they got the material again, five distraction, a third time, five more minutes of math, and then a fourth time, the same material, which is kind of like showing that list again, right? 
Then they were quizzed uh, subsequently at five minutes and a, and a week later. The second group got study, restudy, restudy, and then they got a blank paper. And the last group got study, distraction, blank paper, distraction, blank paper, distraction, blank paper. Each of those blank papers meaning, write, please write down what you recall from your singular reading a couple rounds ago. All right? So S, 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 S means study, 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 study. Then there's study, 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 and a blank paper test, and then study, test, test, test. All right. And the effect we've seen again. Um, the retention just, just immediately thereafter is better for kind of the cram group that gets to see the paper multiple times in a row, study, 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 study. Um, but even a week later, you see again that the study, 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 studies, the cramming effect goes down, and there are, there are countless, I mean, there, are, there probably literally are countless uh, studies now that have subsequently shown across multiple fields from looking at images and art or doing math or German verbs or who knows what that shows the cramming effect works very soon after you um, study it. There's a big drop, often from 90% to 20% in a week. So we do not retain what we cram even a week. And the drop-off is enormous. And we'll see that again in other studies today. All right, so something about the testing effect helps us with long-term retention. All right, now there's, a, there's, there's been an interesting research after this. Like, what's going on there? How does this retrieval practice work? Why does the testing effect work? Um, and there's a notion about what they call necessary forgetting. Something about forgetting. So we'll get into this idea of, of required or necessary forgetting in a moment. But for now, let's just look at how we study forgetting. So what is forgetting? So forgetting is this. You had a certain amount you knew, and then a certain amount that you knew at some time later. And the stuff in between, you forgot. Right? The percent forgotten, not, not, sort of, not such hard math, is that initial amount you forgot divided by how much you originally had. Right? So just for fun, so if you scored 90% on a test initially, and then you took the test a week later and you had 70, right, you've clearly forgotten about 20% of that stuff. But you had the certain amount you had initially was 90%, right? So you can make the 20 over 90, how much you forgot over how much you had. And that gives you your percent forgotten. That's, that's how the sort of forgetting studies get, get done. All right, so this is a 22% forgetting in this example. So when you look at forgetting studies, the effect is also seen. So the study, 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 study group, that group that didn't ever quiz themselves, right? This is how much they forgot in one week, 52%. The study, 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 and then the blank paper drawback group forgot less in the week, and then the study, test, test, test group, less yet. So there's kind of fun ways in which they look at how much you retain, how much you forget. There's all sorts of, um, you know, sort of analogs for this in the education sciences. But we have to think more about forgetting before this morning is over. All right, so I'm going to do a summary at the end of each of the six uh, run-throughs. So here's our little summary. I show you the flashcards again. I show this idea of Socratic quizzing and people quizzing themselves, so the images. Think, think flashcards, think quizzing, and I'll give you up like a pithy line. You learn for retrieval. You learn so you can retrieve later by learning by retrieval. Do retrieval now in order to be able to retrieve later. Quiz yourself now as you go to be able to have it later when you need it. That's the notion of testing for learning. I should just pause and say, does that, does, is there some sense there? Yeah. Now, what I could do, which I won't, because I think this is like when, you're, when you love a place and you respect the people, you don't do this at your opening talk. Okay. Um, but I could say, could you explain to me what is testing for, like you could turn to somebody and do this sort of Socratic cold call thing. But if you're going to do that, the environment already has to know that that's part of how the sort of ethos in the room works. You can't, you can't have like a cold call classroom that nobody knew was a cold call classroom. On the other hand, if you could make a cold call okay classroom, people are very into that, that's completely consistent with Dweck, which we will get to in round five of this, right? So I want to say that the degree to which you can get a cultural ethos where people want to have a room where they're cold called is a great learning room, right? Because that, that's a max quizzing room, all right? That's like a little tickler for later. Or another way of saying that is Dweck is coming. Um, all right, desirable difficulties. The brain is doing the workout, so I'll give you the name again, give you the image again. Here we go. So first we're going to go to educational theory because it's, very, it's core educational theory from one of the most brilliant philosophers probably of, of this or any, of the pre previous or any century, uh, Lev Vygotsky. I'm going to show you Vygotsky, an educational theory notion, then I'm going to show you how the educational science upheld it. So uh, there are many kind of classic Vygotsky-like graphs. Let me tell you how this one is to be read. Level of challenge is the y-axis. Level of competence, how much you're able to do, is the x, horizontal axis. 
right? So just to, for simple, so for simplicity, you can imagine you're very able at something, but the challenge is not so hard, or right, or you're not so able at something, but the challenge is enormous. So very able at something, and the challenge is not hard. Is sort of over here below the green, which he which he labels boredom. If your level of competence is not so high, but the level of challenge is very high, you're above the green area. That's the area called anxiety, stress, duress, punitive, cruel, mean, whatever. All right. But in between those two is some zone, this green zone, where you kind of have a certain level of competence and you have a certain level of challenge. Right? And he named that. It's kind of a, it's an odd name because he was looking at children. And I can tell you how this name came to be. But it's the zone of proximal development, or the ZPD. Mm -hmm. If you want to hang out with educators and look cool, you could say ZPD at a party and all as well. Uh -huh. I'll talking about the ZPD today. Um, all right. So what, what does it mean, though? So below the green, what the learner can, sorry, the, the, the green line, but the, the most sort of, um, the lowest part of the green line, where the green begins, inferiorly, <laughs> um, that's the level the learner can currently achieve independently with no help. As soon as you get into the green, they need scaffolding. They need help. Right, because you're now at some level of um, challenge that's slightly more than the level of competence to do alone. That's what you're doing in the green, is you can do it with help. As soon as you get to the top of the green, um, you, even with help, a learner can't do it. And above that, they, they can't do it and they're anxious. So the green basically it starts at um, what I can do by myself. Then you get into the green, it's what I can do with help. And you get to the top of the green, top meaning if you're going true north, I, I, even beyond this, I can't do it. That's the zone of proximal development. So the whole idea in there, that there's something where you can, it's like a learning challenge, which is right, so long as you get scaffolding or help. How did this translate into his written word? The ZPD, the zone of proximal development, okay, is the distance between the level as determined by independent problem solving, that which they can do, and the level of potential development they could do with help. If a more capable adult or peer were to to support them. That's the green zone. Does that make, does that make sense? <laughs> All right, so let's look, so there, there it is again. But we're not, we're not, doing, we're not doing theory. We have, to do, we have to get into the science of this. So what is the deal with this green zone? Desirable difficulties is the science that demonstrated that there's something true about this theory. So I'm gonna give you this to try to solve for a second. Somebody have it? Do you have to have? Is there someone who, where it's from? Oh, well. She should have, I could have asked it. There would have been a time. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creeps in, petty, et cetera, et cetera. Well, thank you for doing that. Yeah, yeah excellent. Do, you, do anyone recognize the? I'll go, yeah. Thank you for guessing. Good. So to reassure you, this is incredibly reassuring. I was in front of a, a, a rather large audience in the Wellcome Trust in downtown London. Right? It was an entirely British audience, except, except for, for the speaker. And not, not a soul in the room. I kept sort of like leaning a little bit and like hinting a little bit. So a, a British audience should have known. <laughs> So Lady Macbeth is not doing well, right? Lady Macbeth is not doing well. Um, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's, a piece, it's, it's a piece from Macbeth, from Shakespeare's Macbeth. Um, and and you, you nailed it completely. On the, she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day, right? It's the one that goes on to say, out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Um, and I published it in the spirit of like commenting about myself. It is a tale told by an idiot, <laughs> full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. All right. So, but the point was not so that you should know Shakespeare. The point is that there's something odd about this, isn't there? You take these letters out. What does it do when you take the letters out? It's harder. It's harder. 
Makes you read it, actually. Right, it, it does. It, it's as opposed to my putting the six things up there right now, where we're not actually going to attend to them anymore, because you've seen the six things three times already. This, it sort of pulls you in to have to like slow down and read it. Exactly. So there are all sorts of studies of this kind of like quirky game, like these kind of odd games. Just to show you how odd these studies get. Mm. So it's the same piece. And there are actually a series of studies like this, where they will tilt things and turn things and twist things and bubble letters and span, all these things, anything that slows the person's reading down, makes them focus, makes them attend, right? Makes them to do the hard work, increases their capacity to memorize the, the piece. And again, it's been shown across multiple fields. Now, we are not, I am not advising that we make our medical texts on the diagonal or we take letters out. <laughs> <laughs> that would be ridiculous. Um, it's also in medicine, there's, just, there's probably too much to learn and too little time. There's all sorts of efficiencies issues. But it is interesting that slowing down and doing the hard work in, increases learning and retention. That seems, that seems like an interesting thing. And they were very thoughtful, like extremely cool science experiments. i just show you one of the originals from way back in the day that did this. Um, uh, from in this field of desirable difficulties. Now, I'm not sure it's a desirable difficulty, frankly, to take letters away. But there are desirable difficulties we can, in fact, make that slow people down and make them lock in again, right? So, for example, could somebody think of a way I could show the same six things that I showed earlier that could make a desirable difficulty? Like a, a, like a sensible, like not a goofy way, like turning them or something. Mixing them up? Exactly. You could just change the order, right? And there are, there are very cool studies that show that if you change the order of things, in fact, I'll show you in a second, that's been done deliberately in ways that have really fostered learning and retention. Watch this one. Um, so I just wanted to, I wanted to give you one more. When the outline of a lecture, because this is just shows that you nailed it, when the outline of a lecture proceeds in a different order, the textbook passage, the effort to discern the main ideas and reconcile the discrepancy makes better recall. So if you have them learn something in a textbook the night before and you try to repeat it exactly because you think that would be a good way of helping them learn, turns out they might learn. But they will learn more if you didn't do it in the exact same way, right? Or do the same order but use slightly different terms and then define the term using the old term or things like that. You've got to slow people down. Otherwise, they're not just like the list of six. If I showed you right now the list of six, you wouldn't attend to it, even though I've said this like four times, right? So excellent, right? Complaint. Yeah, I think complaint. Yeah. Okay. Now, also in the field of desirable difficulties is the notion of generation. So, and I have a kind of a quirky game to do with you for generation. So, generation is problem solving. Right. That doesn't seem so confusing. All right. And there are great studies of the idea of problem solving as a mode of learning. I just got a few of these two. Generation is problem solving. Generation is not recall. So if I say to you, please tell me the list of six things, that's pretty much a recall thing at this point, right? You learn the six, I ask you the six, you tell me the six, that's recall. Generations are trying to, trying to use those six things to solve some other issue, right? You can imagine engineering school. Let's try it. I'm going to give you a recall notion here. This one is definitely, on, this border is on insulting. I recognize it. Here we go. Every audience I've been in is like, you cannot ask me, like my 10th grade geometry, it's just totally uncool, <laughs> right? So what's the definition of the sine of an angle? Oh, risk, <laughs> risk takers, any risk takers? Measurement of the number of degrees. Uh, an excellent, an excellent, right. So there's, there's, we have a thing, the number of degrees. But the, and then, and then we, it tr turns out that is, that is a component of sine, that is true. But how does, that, how does, that, how does this degree thing get into sine? What? Right. Opposite over hypotenuse. It is that. What was it? What was that? <laughs> you will lose all your friends. You shouldn't even say it again. So the sign of an angle is the opposite over hypotenuse. It's the ratio. It is the ratio of two of two of the lines, which essentially is a different way of understanding the angle. Right. So it's the ratio of this distance over that distance, the opposite of the, from the angle over the hypotenuse. Again, it's interesting. We all had to do this to sort of get into the colleges that got us into the pre-med, that got us into medical, like, right? And yet, poof, gone. That is a sign. But that's clearly a recall question and a mean one at that. If that weren't mean enough, here comes the next one. That is a circle. The recall question. I 
Ooh, look at this. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We have a bid for pi r squared. That's the area. That's the area. That's the area. Yeah. Just yeah. Two pi r. two pi r. Okay. All right. Yeah. Do you guys know each other? Or... <laughs> 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 Study geometry together. Right. Exactly. <laughs> no, free time. Yeah. So, this, but you see, it's another kind of recall question. Like you just sort of know it or you don't, right? But, if, if the, but the point of this is not to like be annoyingly quizzing of you on like geometry, but just to show like classic recall in an, un, an unfortunately unpleasant way. But um, two pi r means there's a radius of a circle. Whoop, there's a radius of a circle, and you take two times the fixed number pi, three point one four one five nine two seven, whatever. Two times pi times that radius is the circumference of that circle around. So we're doing generation. All right now, gen, I'm going to do a, a fun generation question, which I actually have a Colorado idea about. Um, Generation is problem solving. It's not recall. Generation is problem solving. So let's do one. Let's assume the Earth is a perfect sphere. Turns out it's actually not quite a perfect sphere. Let's assume the uh, belly of the perfect sphere is the equator, the midpoint, right? And let's assume it's 24,000 miles. It's more like 24,500 and change, but we'll call it 24,000 for this, for this point. So the average width of a time zone at the equator, how many time zones would there be around the Earth? 24, so the average width of a time zone at the equator would be? 1,000. 1,000 miles wide, right? All right. So you often with these generation things have some base, baseline stuff you've studied so that if you did do a recall thing, the person would have something to recall. Uh, clearly, I'm going to be using this circle thing and this um, uh, sine, cosine thing. So people have some amount of knowledge, content knowledge, which could be open for quizzing, for, with Socratic quizzing, with recall. But then you end up some kind of question that's going to put it to use. So here's our setup. A 24,000 circumference around the Earth, 24 time zones, 24 hours in a day, 24 time zones. Each time zone width at the equator is 1,000 miles if they, were, if they were even. So here's our question for generation. Generation is problem solving. Our question is, what is the average time zone width at latitude of x degrees? Before I, you know, you think, this is just ridiculous. Like, who would even care about this? I'm telling you why I care. Here's why I care. So I'm from Rochester, New York. I know my flat A accent is nearly gone, but I'm from <laughs> Rochester, New York, where my mom and dad have pop. That's how you would say it if you're from Rochester. <laughs> so Rochester, it turns out, is on the same latitude as Boston, Massachusetts. And it's nearly on the exact same latitude as Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I did my residency. So you can actually make a line. Ann Arbor, Rochester, Boston. And they're all in the eastern time zone. Here's what I noticed. Growing up in Rochester, it was dark in the morning. It was light in the evening. In the summertime, it was great. June was amazing, right? We could go play after school for hours. Michigan, even better. Like you come home from residency at night at night, it was still light for 45 minutes. That was good. No duty hours then, but it was good, right? <laughs> so um, the thing is, I, I got this opportunity to move to Boston and Cambridge. So I moved to Boston, same latitude. And all of a sudden, I feel like I'm under an operating room light at 5.30 in the morning. My wife and I are just both there with things over our eyes. It's not an age thing. This has been going on since I was in my, my like, late 20s. It's too bright in the morning in Boston, and the sun sets too early. It's incredibly annoying. <laughs> right. So I was thinking, like, should we actually be in the Atlantic time zone? Like, what is Boston doing in the Eastern time zone, and why did we set our clocks back? This is one of these things that's just frustrating for people like me. You know your life is okay, and this is the frustrating thing. Um, but it was interesting to think, like, is, it, is the Eastern time zone too wide? Right? So I've been playing with this idea and playing with this idea. It's a problem-solving kind of idea. It also reveals that I'm odd. So <laughs> could we solve this? It, but we don't have to. But, but could we solve it? To solve this, you need to use cosine. You need to use the circumference of a circle ideal. There's a way of solving it, it's, and it's not so, so hard. What is, what's the point of the story? Generation is... Problem solving. problem solving. It's not recall. You use things of recall, things you know, to solve a problem. The problem has to sort of, it's ideal, the problem actually matters to the learner. I am not saying you need to care about time zones. Please don't. But, for, but it was sort of irking me in a fun, playful way. It was just sort of making, making me wonder. I cared, about, I cared about knowing the answer. So I had things I had to recall. I had a problem to solve. And the problem kind of mattered to me. Those things all help learning and retention. You can set up classrooms to have that kind of dynamic happen. And because it's just mean to give you a question without an answer, I'll give you the answer. You got to use this triangle, all right? But you notice here, I've switched it. That's that's the that's the sine. That's the sine opposite over hypotenuse. We have to actually use cosine. So here's how it works: that so there's our globe, right? Put that triangle on there. It turns out that this radius here, right at the equator, is the same thing as the hypotenuse. Mm. Mm. That helps us. And you see where the hypotenuse hits up there? It hits up there at a new latitude. 
the latitude is defined by that angle. Mm. The way up there where that green line is on the angle, hitting the, hitting the globe, there's a new circle you could draw around the Earth right there. It has a new radius. That's the new radius up there. That means you have, you have a side, and you have an angle, and you have a hypotenuse. You actually can solve the circumference at that, and then you can divide by 24, and that's the time zone width. Answer, Boston should be in the Atlantic time zone or should not set its clocks back. <laughs> All right. So anyway, desirable difficulties. I, there's the brain doing the hard work. This idea of slowing down. That's the tilted thing. All right, making people have to attend to their reading. And the idea of generation and problem solving, which also is a form of having to kind of do the hard work, not just recall, which can be easy work. Mm -hmm. The field of desirable difficulties is involved in those things. All right. Create learning by creating necessary effort and slowing and generating and not just recall. All right. There's the list in the same order, making sort of intentionally making the error so that you can recognize it in real time. We've done this. We've done this. And now we get to go to spacing and interleaving. So I offer a great, bless you, I offer a great summary by um, Doug Rohrer and Harold, Harold Paschler. It's a, a wonderful study. Which, that you, you would like this because it has the test enhanced learning in it, it has spacing, has interleaving all in one very nerdy, wonderful review article. Um, so spacing, bless you, bless you. Spacing is what the educational sciences call it. Longitudinal is what a lot of us in educational design would call it. Interleaving is what the educational science people call it, and integrated is what the people in um, educational design or structural design would call it. So you, you'll hear this notion of longitudinal integrated clerkships. They're basically just spaced, interleaved clinical experiences, right? In terms, the design terms. All right, what we're doing at design. So now, for those of you who come to Friday's uh, Grand Round Z talk, I'm going to do this, this little frame I'm going to do right here, spacing, interleaving, I'm going to do again. And I'm doing it intentionally, assuming that some of you might even go to that talk. Why? Because by doing that, I will be both spacing and interleaving for you. So you get a special <laughs> gift of doing it twice, or having spacing, <laughs> interleaving in your life. Um, but so what is spacing? So spacing, you have to imagine that I'm going to show you a really uh, edgy three-dimensional graph on the next page. If it's a three-dimensional graph, there must be three axes, x, y, and z. If there's three axes, there must be three things to put in those axes. So here they are. One is the test delay. That's the time between learning and when you're finally asked to demonstrate it. The other axis is the study gap, the time between learning something and then relearning something. The final axis is the test. I've used the same colors on the next graph, this sort of bluish thing, this yellowish thing, and this greenish thing. But the key is the next graph will have three axes, and I want to make sure I'm clear again. People can learn something, then there's some time, and they can learn it again. And the time between those two things is called the study gap. People can learn something ultimately, and then have some time before they actually need to reproduce it. Like, I could finish studying on a Wednesday and be tested the next Wednesday. That would be a test delay. Or much more like how, med how medicine works, we might learn something in our third or fourth year that we have to then do like on our internship. It could be a two-year um, test delay. I, don't, I, I would be embarrassed to tell you the time between my sort of the arterial line that I learned or even the central venous line or even the IV and then my internship. That was kind of a long time. So that, that, those generous and poor patients who had to like endure my fumbling had a long test delay between my ultimate learning and my actually having to be tested. Right? So it could be a real test or it could be the test of life when you have to reproduce what you know. And of course, how much you retain is that green thing, right? So here comes the scary graph, three axes. So on the scary graph, let's just do the axes. One, test delay. That's the time between when you finally learn something and you have to reproduce what you know, an actual test or a procedure or something. Study gap, the time between learn and relearn, test score, how much you retain, three axes. Now I'll take you through, I'll, I'll animate the graph like I'm doing now. If we start up end up in the northeast, kind of the upper right of the graph, those people have a very, very short test delay. That means it's the cramming scenario. They just finished it. The delay is like, I don't know, five minutes or a day. And then they have to reproduce it. You might imagine if you, if you cram, you can, like a test score is high, you retain a lot. Usually between 90 and 100% if the material you're holding on to is not, is not too much. The study gap really has no bearing there. You don't have to like have a space and time between learn and relearn if your ultimate learning is right before your test. However, 
here's where the news gets bad for those who don't space. This little, this little yellow thing I'm gonna put at the bottom down there, even a test delay of three or four weeks, mm. flat. Mm. So what happens is the amount that's retained is that classic, shown again and again and again and again and again and again. 90 to 20 drop. You can hold 90% after five, five minutes to a day, and then you have a 20% in a week to a month. So there's a tr tremendous amount of what people thought they knew that they don't have at three, month, three weeks to a month. And the news gets worse, right? Because if you go over like this, put it out here, test delay of like a year, which I think was in fact my central line ultimate learning to having to do it with a patient. And basically, you're just like, it's near zero. Which I will tell you, I mean, I had like the book open, right? And the, the wonder, extraordinary ICU nurse just saying, not like that, no, no, not that, no, 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 the whole time. I mean, she should have just done it, right? <laughs> so, if we don't, like, how do we, how do we solve this? Like, how do we, if we don't do something, we're gonna have like very little retained if we have a long test delay, and a lot of our knowledge in medical school is, or skill building has got a long test delay. So, here's the thing. You can get back up on the curve with a study gap. That's between some space and time between learn and relearn of the skill of the content. And if you put a study gap in, you can get back up on the curve. Now you'll notice, at a year, you're back up on the curve, but you're still below 20% retention. Right, so we can't hold that much if, if our test is a year later. So something really, really matters. Don't make a test delay of a year, obviously. The key, though, is this. For any amount of test delay, you can see that red line there. For any amount of test delay, see? There's a, there's a highest height on the curve. There's the most you can retain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. there's a, you can maximize learning. But there's something much more important than that. The curve is not shaped evenly, isn't it? There's a cliff edge on one side of the curve over here, and there's a flat edge on the other side. What that actually means is, if you, I try to make the green arrow look like it's swinging a little bit, the more you need to retain it longer into the future, the more study gap you need Right? It's swinging that way, right? So the longer out the test delay, longer out the time between ultimate learning and final needing to show it, the more study gap you need. And if you make too much study gap, you're over there on the flat part. You're not maximizing, but you're, you're, you're close to the max. But if your study gap is too short, you're always on the cliff edge. Like you, you, if, you're, if you don't have enough time between learn and relearn for any amount of test delay, you're really not close to the max. Better to have learn and relearn be further apart, too far apart, than not have learn and relearn or have them too close together. Make sense? That's the core essence of multiple studies of the spacing effect. So that is painful. Um, but you get this idea. Study gap matters, and more study gap matters if you're going for longer term retention. How come that's not cramming closer to the test that's further away? Yes, so, it, so cramming by definition means it's within like five minutes to a day. Okay. So, yeah, now it is true that it's, it's sort of a little bit like doing mammograms in 50 year olds. Like, you know, the, the, the data seem to show that 50 year olds is the, the right age to do mammograms. What happens if you're 49 and a half? Like, was, it, like, was there no benefit 49 and a half year olds, right? Or 49 year olds? So there, it is clear that, you know, still studying closer to an event is still helpful. Right. But if, if the only thing is studying very close to an event, you're going to have a large 90 to 20 about cliff. So more iterations helps. Right, space between iterations helps. More space be up between or among iterations can help, right? But no spacing, which is kind of how we do it in medicine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not even trying to say like we have to space a little more nuanced in a nuanced way. I'm kind of saying like we don't space in medicine at all. So binge purge, right? So mm -hmm. it's just an appeal. I'm just trying to appeal to the idea that study gap may be helpful and there's sort of ample educational science to show it. All right, so study gap is my little thing. All right, thankfully, that's the hardest, that's the hardest slide of the entire talk. It's all, it's all simple from here. All right, interleaving is very straightforward. It just means learning multiple things simultaneously. So you can imagine learning things in block fashion, A, 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 then you learn B for a while, then you learn C for a while. Or you can imagine you can learn A, B, C, B, C, A, C, A, B. You can learn multiple things simultaneously. So for, for fun, did anybody speak a second language? Okay, anybody speak a third language? All right, so for the for three language learning, pediatricians in the room? All right, oh, I get to, to play a peds thing with no one to, to, to chaperone me on this. All right. Um, I think they're hiding. Right, so, so, of course I do. Um, the uh, people who, you know, children learn three languages at once. 
three or more, but let's say let's make it easy for it. They have three languages at once. They actually have speech delay. So if you're trying to three languages simultaneously, it's harder. So the slowing down phenomenon. Um, and they will look, let's say, I don't know, English, Mandarin, and Spanish, right? So they're kind of different, very different languages. Um, if you do three at once, you have speech delay. You don't, you're not as good at English, you're not as good at Mandarin, you're not as good at Spanish. But if you keep going with all three, you end up catching up. So you, you have three languages, and you can do English as well as an English speaker, Spanish as well as a Spanish speaker, and Mandarin as well as a Mandarin speaker if you go long enough, right? But what's really important about interleaving is this. Yes, there's a drag, there's a, J, a J-shaped curve. Yes, there's a thing where you like, have speech delay initially. Yes, in the end, you can have three languages if you push through, but if you try to teach that child Russian, which is not like English, not like Spanish, not like Mandarin, right? They're much more facile, much more able to learn Russian, this fourth language, than someone who spoke two languages or one. So not only do they have three languages, which they are now equal in, they actually have a better language center overall. So interleaving has an enormously important effect in domain learning, right? If you do multiple things within music, you're better at the next complicated musical thing that has nothing to do with what you already learned, right? Here's a simple study. Um, if you look at an interleaved learner, right, and you test them immediately after, they are not as good as the block crammer. Again, this, to, to your point, Shanta, the, the, the cramming does work for testing immediately after. But even a week later, again, right, you see the difference. And I just thought I would animate this with a little sound effect because it's another way of learning. So there's our block person up around 90. And then one week later, you have this. Mm. <laughs> right? So just to just remind, there's this 90-20 drop is a real thing. We have to do things in the learning and retention sphere to try to pre- pre- prevent this kind of great de- um, decline in, our, in what we can hold. Interleaving holds up very, very well. And of course, the fun of this is we just did that painful three-dimensional graph of spacing. It's not like you're learning something, doing absolutely nothing, mm-hmm. and then learning something, and then doing absolutely nothing, right? You could learn something and learn something else and learn something else, and then back to your original. You can space and interleave together. They go together, no? Because in your spaced time, you can put some other element in, which itself can be spaced in between. You can do multiple things simultaneously and repeating and over time. You can create study gaps and multiple things together. Okay, so the classic way I like to show that is this. Imagine that we did this. Math for eight weeks and then no more math. Then English for eight weeks and then no more English and no more math. Let's leave bio out. Let's, let's call that getting fit, like fitness training for eight weeks. And then no more fitness, no more English, no more math. And then you do your Latin for eight weeks. By the time you finish the Latin, you are out of shape, can't speak, and can't calculate, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't, like learning, dropping, learning, dropping, learning, dropping. No one does this. Like, this is not how our schools were when we were little, right? Our schools were like that. Now, this is not some kind of blind appeal to longitudinal integrated clerkships. It is actually a blind appeal to longitudinal. It is, <laughs> all right? Because I could just go like this, right? Um, yeah. but, but I do it, I do it for another reason. We accept, we accept that top part as normal, but we wouldn't accept that top part as normal. That's odd. Because we all went through, we got K through 12 on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And something odd happened, and we do that, right? So it's actually a little sort of an LIC twist to our tail. But the bottom line is the, the thing, the, the graph below, you can see how it can be both spaced and interleaved, right? Because you have the time, you can learn and relearn medicine, and you're learning and relearning medicine as we learn and relearn pediatrics. All right. So we're going to do our summary. We always do these summaries. So here's our summary for spacing, right? The open road. Create enough time between learning and relearning. Spacing. That's the time. All right. Interleaving. That's the pictures we've been talking about. This is the notion that we've been using throughout the talk today. Mixed experiences. Learn and practice multiple things at once. All right. We have done now. What am I going to show next for the slide, do you predict? Oh, I'm not getting on the horse. Excellent. Right. So you already knew Dweck was coming. Right? So I put the six up, and I say, we did this, we did that, we did this, we did that. But see, just again, is this how I should do it? If I should, should I just click through? Because I'm doing that. You're not paying attention. You are not listening. Right? <laughs> right? So again, be careful when we do these, these kind of, this is kind of classic teacher error. You put the thing up for the fourth time or the fifth time. You say, we've done this. We did. No one is listening. They know the six things. They know what they've done. Right? So just be aware of this idea of what I would call fake repeating. It's only real repeating of use if the person actually is likely to attend to it in some different way different way, which fosters their learning. All right. Loved work. 
Again, I offer you the book. I, have no, I don't have any stake in this book, except for that it changed my entire life and my whole family, but other than that, it's fine. Um, so I will tell you, I'm going to tell you a, a story about my family and, and Dweck in a minute. Um, but the idea is this idea of getting back up on the horse, right? Um, so that's the image we've been using for Dweck. You are trying to ride, you fall off, you've got to get back up on the horse. What's the metaphor mean, really? Don't give up. Yeah, don't give up, don't quit, try again. Right? And, the, and Dweck has shown this with incredibly rich, empirically derived science. So let me just give you just a quick, this is a word slide, just to tell you about Dweck's origins. I'll tell you a story. All right. There were all of these great educational theorists. And we can sort of go through the kind of classic list of these near Nobel Prize winning people, one after the next. Dewey, obviously, the great philosopher. Rogers, near the the Nobel Prize for relational learning. Bandura, social learning theory. Noddings is a feminist and moral development theoretician. Keegan, the great adult, adult, adult development theory. Situated learning, and then Stephen Bill at his workplace learning, these great theorists. Oh, again, we're, we're promising ourselves science in this room. And she was very moved by um, the work of social learning theorist Ben Dura and the work of uh, Seligman, who was very much into learned helplessness. And you can see in her theory in a moment that these really are the foundation of her, of her scholarship. So that led us to Dweck in the late 70s, late 1970s. So what she basically found over the next 25 years or 30 years at Stanford uh, with her graduate students was about learning and resilience. Now, this spun off into all sorts of kind of fun, funky literatures, like it's in the parenting literature, in the praise literature. Like, are those literatures? Um, <laughs> but they, it became quite popularized, and Dweck is quite misunderstood and misused. So I'm going to try to give you what I would call core Dweck. All right, so core Dweck, because you can, in a moment you'll hear how the error is made. Um, core Dweck has to do with this idea of getting back on the horse, being, being nourished by the retry. All right. So the way it happened, I think, that is best uh, explanatory is a, a study that was done, I think, in the mid-80s, like 85, 86. And Dweck and her researchers were looking at students in the classroom. Now, I'm going to use the language of the researchers. This language is not fully inclusive of our modern notions of gender. Um, but the, the language they used was, um, boys and girls. Now, clearly in this classroom, probably that was not a fully explanatory or respectful um, framework, but I'll just use the language of the researchers for the moment. They looked at, quote, boys and girls in the classroom, and they noticed something. The girls, the girls were doing substantially better by a lot. Um, they were doing better on their homework. They were doing better on the test. They were paying more attention. They were essentially these refined young six- or seven-year-old learners. All was well with them. These things that were known as boys, um, they were more like a pack of squirrels, right? They were kind of all over the place. So they were sitting in a chair for a while. It was a great day. So I have three sons, so I, I know the feeling. So they, they were noticing the boys also weren't doing as well. They weren't attending to the assignments. And it turned out they also noticed the girls were getting much more praise for their work. Outstanding, brilliant, excellent, genius, right? All that's the kind of stuff that the people who are girls were hearing. But we were getting like, yeah, I noticed the way that you're listening. Thanks for that. I appreciate the way you're using good eye contact there. Like these sort of like offhanded process sounding like little things because they were trying to get the boys to just like sit in the chair, right? <laughs> so they gave the children problems they couldn't solve. And what happened was the boys would sit there kind of either alone or together. How do, what's the trick here? I can't figure this out. And they, they wanted to figure it out. But they actually were sort of in some ways more locked in than ever. The girls, I'm so stupid. I can't. I've never been good at this. I'm not good at math. I'm so, they were, not only they would they quit, but they were, they were quitting with these negative views of themselves. It was extremely upsetting. Like, it should upset us. It upset the researchers. Um, so the, being good researchers, they did sort of very empirical. They just observed and observed and observed. And they thought, you know, I wonder whether this feedback notion is part of the thing. The girls are getting these kind of adjectives and nouns, right? And the boys are getting these kind of verbs and process things. So they taught the teachers to be accurate with their feedback, but cross over the, the nature or the manner of feedback. The boys weren't getting more praise. They were still getting the, like the level of appropriate comment. But the comment came then as a adjective or noun, where the girls were getting the proper level for their great work, but it was more um, process-based, verb, verb. And the effect crossed over. When they gave the kids problems they couldn't solve, the boys quit, were, were all negative up about themselves, and the girls uh, hung in and kept trying to solve it. So, this is why it's sort of it's called the praise literature. Sometimes it's thought of as feedback literature. This is the mid-'80s. Within the next 10 years, they found out that actually it wasn't the feedback matters. Feedback matters enormously, and the method of feedback matters, but it wasn't that. It turns out that they uncovered that um, people hold unconscious ideas about themselves. Feedback helps foster these. They hold unconscious ideas about themselves uh, around talent or moral development or intelligence, fitness, ability, all these abilities, and these are called the self-theories. So her question was, why do people fall apart 
despite having received praise and having confidence and all this long history of success. There were two implicit theories, or self-theories, she later called them. Um, one is called the incremental theory. One is called the entity theory. I'll define these in a moment. The growth mindset, which we hear popularized a lot now, essentially is the incremental theory, or the learning mindset. The entity theory goes along with the fixed mindset, or the performance mindset. It, it, it's amazing. Um, in most every domain they studied, it's nearly 40%, 40%. About 40% of people are sort of in this incremental growth learning kind of way of looking at this domain, and about 40% or more in this entity fixed performance way of looking at the domain. Um, what do you mean? What do you mean looking at? We hold unconscious beliefs about our own abilities. So here's, here would be me. You said, so Dave, Colorado is the most fit state in the country. It actually is. It's so great. Um, and it's not, by the way, it's not just the altitude. People get out and go. It's fantastic. Um, I was in Michigan, which was sort of not exactly that. Um, so it turns out that if you ask me, do you think you could be kind of you know, fit like a Colorado? And I might say, no, nah, I'm not that fit. I said, but do you think you could maybe, I don't know, could you could run a half marathon? I'd say, sure. If I trained, I could run a half marathon. Right? I have this idea that if I just worked hard, I would be able to do it. He said, Dave, do you think you can learn Mandarin? Which I've tried three times. Um, I, would say, I would say something like, I'm not good at language. And notice the difference. If I just worked at it, I could become fit enough to run a half marathon. This idea, it's an incremental idea. If I just learn more, work hard, I got it. The other one is about who I am. I'm just not a good at language person. That's an entity or fixed mindset. The fact is, I actually, until I sort of started reading to it, I actually held these views. Like, I didn't know I held these views, but I had all these things right there. I'm just not good at that. Dave, do you think you could speak more slowly? Probably not. Um, <laughs> if, if I work at it. Um, right, if I work at it. So we have these unconscious views of ourselves we don't even know we have. Sometimes they can be brought to consciousness. So here's the, here are the numbers again. About 80% of people hold one or the other of these. Binary, like one or the other. And it's about 40-40 for most domains. Domains are like intelligence, talents, moral character. Um, all right. And ultimately, what are they? These are networks of complexes. They call it complexes or complexes of beliefs, and they're held unconsciously. That's what the self-theories are. So that's kind of the nerdy science of it. There is some more fun, though, to be had with this. So it turns out they're, um, they're generally equal. I mean, whether you're entity or incremental, you're generally equal in, a, in intelligence at the baseline. But what do you predict what happens? Remember, we saw that green bar of the zone of proximal development earlier. I'm drawing you back now, earlier mm -hmm. in the talk, to Vygotsky. <laughs> that green bar from Vygotsky, the zone of proximal development. I just paused for seven seconds, which I can't endure, but right, to think about that. What do we think happens, though, when things get harder? Do entity theorists do better, the fixed mindset people, or do growth mindset people, the incremental theorists, do better? Growth. Yeah. So it turns out that we are equal to baseline intelligence, and if, we, and if we're within our comfort zone, but if, if the harder things get, the more the growth mindset matters for actually pushing people to the, towards their expertise. So ultimate achievement goes along with the growth mindset, so it really matters to get people into the growth mindset, which makes us worry about one thing. Makes us worry deeply. Are they mutable? Are they fixable? Can you change one? So the way that I would characterize it to you is this. My son, Samuel, they, oh, I have twins. The older of the twins comes home um, from school. Now, the school my wife and I chose for the twins is a school entirely devoted to Dweck's work. It's, I, I, this, I love the school. Um, it, it's just brilliant. And they, they, come, they come home from school one day, and they're together in the, the foyer, and Sam says to me, I don't know, Dad, this school, all this talk about the growth mindset, and I know you and Mom are really into the growth mindset, and... I don't know, I just, I, just, I just don't have the growth mindset. <laughs> and then I'm looking at him, and he looks up and he says, yeah. Oh. You get it? Yeah. Like, that's a growth mindset attitude. Yeah. Right, so there's this whole idea now about yetting. Right? You've got to be a yetter, or you've got to have this yetting. His, the, the joke that he was trying out as a 12-year-old was the idea that he was a fixed mindset person, because I'm just not a growth mindset person. Right? But then when he says yet, of course, the suggestion is he could get there if he tried. So it, coy and bizarre, this little joke, but, but uh, you get the idea. Um, I just thought I'd throw this one in for fun since we're in a very political time in the country. I'm not saying anything. I just think it's interesting. <laughs> All right, but here's the key, and this is absolutely the key to the whole thing. Um, growth mindset does help enormously, is important enormously, especially when things get tough, especially when you want to go to the frontier of what you can know and do, right? And, and the self theories can be changed and lead to exchanges in behavior. So... I'm just going to show one more quick ride, which I will. Um, I, I'm going to tell the same joke on Friday, just be forewarned. So my wife and I are walking in Stellenbosch <laughs> in South Africa. 
And um, we, I pause, and I see this, I see this thing. Oh my gosh, and I pull up my camera. And my wife is a real educator, like a real, real educator, not like her husband. She knows education well. And she says, oh, please, oh, no, 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 no. Please tell me you don't see a metaphor for medical education here. <laughs> Allison, I do see a metaphor for medical education. She says, ethical erosion? I said, I, it is ethical erosion. <laughs> ethical erosion is a field which we're now going to discuss just in about three minutes. Um, it's the field in the literature that looks at um, the, hard, the, the harm or the hurt that is done to learners as a consequence of medical education, right? So here you see the, here you see the, the beautiful verdant flowers all, all plant all ready to bloom and burst out like our students, held, out, held back by razor wire, right? Which obviously is really a metaphor for South Africa if you think about it. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick, quick ride through ethical erosion because it matters because Dweck has a chance to sort of affect this quickly. It just means students are hurt or harmed. They decline in professionalism. They decline in idealism. Something bad happens as a consequence of medical education. So early studies were this, this one by um, Feudner and Christakis and Christakis, which was a study of 665 medical students in the six eastern Pennsylvania medical schools. As you know, this is a diverse set of medical schools. Um, and they had these like page after page of terrible news on the survey. Here, the 98% of students surveyed who heard derogatory comments about their patients. Please hear. This is not swearing, spitting, or being rude. This is about the patient. She's a this. Like, just terrible. I mean, it, right, it invites the question, like, what percent would be okay? They're like, if 44% of students heard derogatory comments, would they really good? Right? So, I mean, that should be zero. Um, and it's not even the worst. The worst may be this one. It's the 32, that by the third of the students, 32% of students who felt like an accomplice to a crime at participating in traditional block rotations in the 6th Eastern Pennsylvania Medical Schools in 1994. I mean, shocking. And literally, there are three or four or five pages like this in this article. And we can say, well, was it, was it a good trial? Were they the right schools? Was it the right sample? But it, it launched a literature, is the point. It launched a field of ethical erosion, studied subsequently by some really thoughtful people, like Paul Hayden, many of you may know, and his colleagues. They found students decline in their patient-centeredness in medical school and decline mostly in the core clinical year. So, so there may be a resilience question there. There's a Dweck thing in this, I think. There's a resilience question. Could they hang in the, in the face of a hard environment? Students decline using validated tools. Um, they decline in their empathy in medical school, mostly in their core clinical year. And there's a resilience question, and that's awful, right? Students show blunted moral development on Lawrence Kohlberg's DIT scale, perhaps the most validated of all social science tools. They be gendered, but they decline in moral development compared to age-matched peers. They decline mostly in their core clinical year. I'm not saying this happens at the University of Colorado. I am not. I'm just saying that in the studies have shown that across the U.S. there have been a series of like harms done to students. It gets us into this notion of resilience a bit. And at a time of burnout and depression and suicidality, we have to think of resilience a lot. We also have to think about the educational environments a lot, right? So there's, there's something to be done here, I think. Students' decline in their moral development relates to medical professional training, not nursing, not dentistry, not veterinary medicine. It's medical school, and it's the core clinical year. And bad things that happen now predict bad things that happen later. So it's not like they're just going to bounce back and do better. Females bounce back better, but all learners do not bounce back. So the harm is not good, which invites the question of changing our environment, one of the themes, I think, of our transformative moment here, and it involves the question of dweck and resilience. I put this back up. Um, so I'm just going to say it one more time. They're equal in the general population, all right, including in resilience. But, the, but growth people go further. So we can actually foster resilience in people by turning the way we teach towards growth mindset language, changing our classrooms to places where everybody would want to raise their hand. Because of what? Because the essence of Dweck is just this, the horse picture. If you fall off the horse, there's two ways of experiencing that. One is, I'm not good at horseback riding. The other one is, ha, oh, my butt. All right, back up on the horse. Because people, some people, when they have the growth mindset, they see it as fulfilling, meaningful, part of the process, truly nourishing to fail. Like getting back up on the horse is kind of like, I got this. All right, off the horse you go again. I got this. Off the horse you go again. All right, I got right? Because the joy is in that, is in that journey. The meaning is from the journey. If I think we probe ourselves, that's really hard to do, right? But we can foster that in our classrooms. And I would just say again, the reason why I showed you the book cover is I can't do all of Dweck in one talk or five talks. It is stunningly brilliant work over 30 years. She should win the Nobel Prize. I mean, it is some of the most important work you can imagine. All right, and then finally, just this. We can change our self-theories. We can, our students can, there's ways to do it. 
Um, and we'll get back, as I finish the talk here, I'm gonna do some little Dweckian things to show you. All right, there's the images. <clears throat> we wanna foster nourishment from the process, from the hard work, from getting back up. I do something kind of sort of cheesy here that that was kind of fun. See the little, the little picture down there at the bottom on the right? The way, I can get back without the barbed wire, right? We can take those chains off too. So one thing is to foster resilience. Another thing is to take away a system which would require such resilience, right? So we have the chance to change our education systems and not have these harms happen, or to have them happen only very rarely. All right, finally, <clears throat> deliberate practice, which is very easy now because it's linked to all the rest. Very linked to Dweck, very linked to desirable difficulties. You will know it already. There's the coach and the student. He's correcting her. So there's a very popularized idea uh, of the 10,000 hours. Anybody? Yeah. Who taught about oh. the 10,000 hours? Anders, or um, Anders. Well, it was Malcolm Gladwell, but yeah. The, yeah. The work was there. Uh, Excellent. Anders, right? So watch. And it was different. It was not really. Didn't really say 10,000 hours. So. Fantastic. So I can turn, so I was, I'm going to say to you, just between the two of us in the room where there's nobody else, that was outstanding. But I shouldn't say outstanding. I shouldn't say excellent. I shouldn't say brilliant. I shouldn't say great. All right? I should say thank you for sharing this with the classroom because that obviously helped the whole classroom. And you absolutely nailed it with this characterization of the difference between the 10,000 hours notion and K. Anders Erickson's original notion, which was not just about 10,000 hours. So by my commending the fact of that successful comment, right, as opposed to the person who made the successful comment, I'm doing dweck. Right, we've got to turn towards naming what was right about it and not brilliant. Thank you. That was excellent. That's bad dweck. All right. So try to avoid your impulse towards praise. I'm kind of a sweet, nutty, happy guy, and I'm inclined to always say, oh, so cool, great, amazing. But you try to turn language towards process. K. Anders Ericsson. How about that? Yeah. Right. Anders Ericsson. Great guy by the way, I'm a lo lovely person, who looked at this idea of, of expert practice, making experts, and the notion is this. It is true that you can get better by practicing. I mean, absolutely, and the more hours you do, the better you'll get. It is not true that you can reach expertise, that elegant place of expertise. Now, we can get into this argument whether there is a place of expertise. Those who are into adaptive expertise would say there's no place. But, I, but I'm saying the place, I mean the getting better and getting better and getting better place, I'm not naming some uh, final place. Because what experts do is this. They can keep looking at it in perpetuity, trying to see if they can see it anew, anew. Can I see that same stuff I think I know so well, again, differently, right? This relentless pursuit of trying to understand something better, yet better. Anew, anew, right? Or the ever novice is the true expert, right? So it turns out you can get better and better and better by practice, but you can get to this sort of elegant place of what you might call expertise, by practice under scrutiny and correction. And that's the core essence of it. It's not so many hours, more hours helps. It's that beyond the hours comes the idea of getting corrected. And you hear the Dweck in this. So and Anders Ericsson and Dweck were looking at something similar from different perspectives. Here's the quick one page run and we're out. All right, you've got to have a mental representation of that which you're trying to do. So having, like having my children now listen to Beethoven, that, that's not the mental representation of how they should be able to play, let's say piano. That's way too far beyond. They need a representation that's much more proximal to where they're going to go next, right? You must practice, often by yourself, of course, and practice on the most difficult parts. Do you smell the dweck? The most difficult parts will pop you off the horse. Do you smell the Vygotsky, the desirable difficulties, right? Do the hard work, slow down. The whole thing, and in fact, we did this, Wendy, together at a um, summer camp. We, we did this together, Doug, we did this. This whole idea of like, um, You've got to do your strengths finder. You to, well, you have a strength. Don't, like, why are we working so hard on the hard stuff? We should find what is, who, it, who it is that to be us and do our strengths. That is really appealing. It is just really not evidence-based, right? It may even feel really good. I'm not even against it. It's just not evidence-based for learning. For learning, it's the opposite. The science of learning says you've got to work on the hard stuff, right? Practice hard on the most difficult parts. Receiving corrections is a must. Receiving corrections is an absolute must. You've got to get corrected. Now, the horse is not going to turn to the rider and say, if you want to stay on me, here's the deal. So there's something great about the dweck of getting back on the horse, but there's also something about having another you know, cow hand to say, like, okay, look, here's what you're not doing right, man. Right? You've got to do effort beyond the comfort zone. Again, you sense the Vygotsky in this and the, and the dweck in this and the desirable difficulties in this. Yes, it's related to self-theories. 
to build expertise, one should try and fail. Work on your weaknesses. Put a lot of effort in. Persist. Dweck. All right, so that, oh, sorry, I can just leave it for a second. And here comes the grand finale of all this, right? There it is. Practice makes progress, right? Practice makes progress. Is that what Erickson said? No. No. Right. So. Erickson actually said that practice getting critiqued, getting corrected, makes, progress, makes the progress you actually need. So practice makes progress. It's true. But there's something beyond that. Practice and get scrutinized. Again, we have to set up learning scenarios wherein students not only don't mind getting scrutinized, they crave getting scrutinized. So I can tell you longitudinal integrated clerkship stories until I'm blue in the face. I can just tell you 16 years of these LICs. It's crazy me. Um, totally joyful. But the thing I cannot stress enough is the thing that has been by far the most joyful for me and for my patients, for my office staff, for the, for the students, everybody wins on this one. So right now I've got Kathleen and Kim. The deal with Kathleen and Kim is in my clinic is this. I, I, do, I, have, them, I have them back and forth every other week. We have a deal where they're going to expect, want, they're going to demand that I criticize them you know, warmly, engagingly, nothing mean, or, um, as a routine way that we communicate. And I'm going to demand the same of them. So we have this whole thing where it's like, you no, know, so you can't hold your hands that way. Because if you hold your hand, what do you think is going to happen if you hold your hands that way? She's like, yeah, yeah, I totally get it. Because when I, like, we can just have the, we can have the conversation every time, at all times. And what happens when they leave the clinic? I get these little like, messages in my text or my, my, my computer. Oh my God, I can't wait till next week's clinic. It's, I looked for, it's the island of light in my ear. I go, uh, like this, right? It, it's hyperbolic. But, but, it, but it, seems like, it seems like it's counterintuitive. I'm sure they're getting more kind of heat in my clinic. I'm very friendly. I don't want to give a wrong impression. But they're getting more scrutiny in my clinic for certain than probably in, in any other place. I want to tell you, though, Kathleen and Kim are not longitudinal integrated clerkship students. They're block students at Mass General Hospital. We have a primary care clerkship thing currently. Harvard's kind of transitioning towards longitudinal design, but as it's in its transition moment, there are still block clerkships, and they send students out, out, like out of the real place, into the wilds. They send students out um, to have this longitudinal experience in primary care. So I, um, so I have these two block students who are, who are seeing, this is one of the nation's great hospitals, but are seeing this silly little time with me, like this some schmo, as being meaningful. Why? Because they're getting this kind of attention which they feel correctly is all about serving them. So you can, we, can do, we can set these things up. I'm not even sure that I'm not, I'm not good at it. We just make these learning contract things that work. Do the work. Make mistakes. Get corrected. Persist. Do the work. Make mistakes. Get corrected. Persist. Do the work. Blah. All right. Here's our, here's our grand finale. We have the sex. You know it's coming. You know it's coming. <laughs> right? So we're going to go through the sex. And what am I likely to do? Right. So this is your last chance. Mm -hmm. All right. One, two, three. We'll do 30 seconds to see if you can draw back retrieval practice to draw back, to draw back your six. All right, and? If you want to, you want to do this in a quizzing way, like not just it's not a list because a list is recall, right? I sort of baited you there. Like the list is only recall. It's actually like you want. Okay, so the first one is test enhanced learning. What was it? What was the graph for that? What's the image for that one? What's the graph for that one? Uh, that silly little thing about person quizzing themselves, right? So as you as you're drawing them back, don't draw back a list because in the end you don't want a list in your mind. In the end you want to sort of have the essence of them. So you quiz yourself as you go. Like do I really get that? read, cover it up and see if you understand. When, I don't know, radio's on and you hear a great TED talk or something, after it's over, say, like, so I think the essence of the TED talk, what was the point there? Right? And do these drawbacks. All right. We will do a very brief, grab somebody quick, 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 quick. See if you can both make the list together, but also exp explain out of your mouth, Spanish out of the mouth. <clears throat> explain quickly what it actually meant, the core takeaway from each of the six. Excuse me. I'm not going to do that. 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 I'm not
programming work really well for Yeah, well, welcome to the club. I ain't in charge of anything anymore. Fascinating. But, uh, you know, what the who's in charge of IP? He was saying, I think he was And she's doing the for each other. No, she's not. Um, the I don't are you uh Move better, walk better, and I was thinking my daughter is taking the ACT on this weekend. I was thinking the grant, like how my husband is trying to do this just a semester. But it's I just liken to my roommate, a fellow medical student, who had photographic memories. It's hard to start off right away. Practice, okay? That's the next one. I wonder how much you would have made. I am too. And I know that I always love it, but I do catch myself at times where I'm like, I can it. has to be a good thing. And also, there's a motivational interview. I'm asking them, like, they have to be a good thing. Yeah. Because also, it all ties into the person. Not you, of course, but... Yes. And, and we're trying to like it. Are we good? Can you change everything? Right. I want to get Okay. All right. We'll get, we'll get back together to just finish the talk. Did we, were, we able to, were we able to get most of the six? Yes, great. That's so nice. Luck of you. I know. Yes. Yes. All right, guys. So, um, right, so let's do a, we'll do a quick, we'll do a quick run through, but not, not just to get the six as a list, of course, to get the six as an essence. So does somebody want to offer one of the six and sort of what its essence is? Deliberate practice. Is? Uh, practice with correction and coaching so you continue better. Deliberate practice. You practice and you get corrected as you go. You understand the, the hardest elements that are before you. You work on the hardest elements. You have some scheme in your mind of where you're going approximately. At alone, you've got to work, but you've got to get corrected. Absolutely. Second one. Test and hands no order. learning. We'll do test and hands. They tell you love test and hands learning. So test and hands learning. What's that? What's the core essence of it? Learning by retrieval. You learn by retrieval, so you can subsequently retrieve. Bang. Yep. All right. Oh yeah, yeah. They here one over here. Bill. Oh, I was just giving him the rationale for not doing this in order. It should be interleaved. So it's not, we're not going to do it in order because, because of what of the six things? Which of the six things says don't do it in order? Oh. Desirable difficulty. Des desirable difficulty. You're, yeah, yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. Right. Because it's harder to not go in the order. Right. So, what, so desirable difficulties are? 
Slow it down. Slow it down. Generation. And generation. Yeah, generation is problem solving. Yeah, to generate or problem solve. Exactly. Not just recall. Exactly. What else you got? Wax theories of mind. Dweck's self theories. Exactly. So, what about what the essence of Dweck's self theories? So growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. My favorite term, Ancora and Paro, comes to mind. The mindset of you're still learning, you're still growing, versus I am this, and therefore this is where I sit. Right. Who, who I am and what I do are not linked. Right? It's, it's not like I, I'm great because I did X, Y, and Z. It's the, the, the feeling of goodness and achievement comes from the actual doing itself. The journey is the thing. The hard work is the thing. You're nourished by the process. But by the time they have gone through exactly and get to medical school, how can one? I mean, it would take an entire village to do that. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody all the time to change one mindset to another. It's so. I don't see how that is even possible. You had me at it takes a village. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> um, but it, it is true. I think the thing that's really, really helpful is, is that if they know it's a value, they can work on it. And if we know it's a value, we can work on it. And we will not be perfect. And to be sure, what is great about medical education of now as opposed to medical education of the past, and not being obsequious, what's great about the moment at Colorado now as opposed to maybe moments in the past, is that you actually have the village and the village gets it. Like, you are building an educational future together. And into your future, you can build the things that you want to do to foster resilience and learning and humanism and professionalism and character and comportment. So we can actually start to work on our own way in which we engage learners and let them in on this clue. So learners who come to Cambridge to do the longitudinal integrated clerkship all get Dweck the opening day. They all get Dweck throughout. They all know they're going to go through a J-shaped curve as they interleave. Like, we, we, we do this with them. Because there's no, it's, there's, no, there's no we and they. There's no game. We all just want to learn. And we, the faculty, also turn ourselves over to being people of yet also. Pe yetis, people of yet. Right? Like, I, I didn't teach this topic today to you as well as I might yet. I'll keep trying. Right? I, could, I can already reflect right now on several things I probably need to do. Like not speak so quickly. Get more rest and stuff. So, so you have the village, and, the, and now you actually, the village actually has tools. So... It turns out it doesn't need to be perfectly penetrated to work. So even though my children's school is like a very Dweckian school, there are tons of places where the Dweck stuff is the exact opposite, like in their school that's avowed to it. So that's okay. Um, not to be silly about this, but even the work at Dweck itself requires the growth mindset, right? Like we have to keep at it. So I think that's an extremely, extremely important point and very uplifting to think about the moment happening here. Um, all right, we've done four. Spacing. What is the essence of spacing? Hard curve that it was. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. The whole thing. I love the spacing. <laughs> okay. Spacing. What's the core essence of spacing? It's not just learn and relearn, but what? Do you need more time in order to time. be able to retain longer? Yes. Um, it's learn and relearn, but spacing between and more spacing between is the better mistake to make. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, any, any other ones, finally? Yeah. Oh, but you can do silly teacher clues in class, actually, and it actually helps. You can do like, subtle things, like, are there any other things that we need to think about here? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, what's, what, what's the essence of interleaving? LICs. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> multiple things simultaneously may slow you down, may be harder, but multiple things simultaneously improve learning and retention. All right, I'm, we're going to stop, but I just want to show you one last thing that the kind of coy end goes like this. We show each thing in turn, right? And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause and say, what's the next one I'm going to show? So now I can use the order to our advantage, right? If I just pause, we can quiz on it as opposed to just flipping it. So what's the next one? What's the second one? Yes, Wendy, Wendy's doing the brain lifting the weight, right? What's the next one we do? What's the image? Right. What's the next one? What's the image? What's the next one? What was the image? And then finally? Right. And again, we, not to be goofy about it, but we can do this when we're sitting in lectures ourselves as learners. We're doing CME. We can, we can do this sort of forced drawback as we go, right?
<laughs> you only had it once earlier today. <laughs> what they were? Encoding, storage, retrieving. What do they mean? Mm -hmm. Acquisition. 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 Yeah. Persistence. Persistence. Yeah. Later use. Later use. Yeah. Bang. Yep, exactly. All right. <laughs> so I thought I'd just put a little Dweckian joke at the end here. Get it? <laughs> All right. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you this morning. So tell us our tell us our timing. Do we have we're good. So um, our next um, workshop is on um, it's called LIC one hundred and one. So it's going to be sort of the nuts and bolts on how to start um, an LIC program, which um, Dave Hirsch is really the sort of world's expert huh. on, and runs these workshops all over the world. So um, for those of you who will be involved in our um, wide our sort of statewide initiatives to start LICs. Please stick around for that. Um, I think we have a little, a little bit break. of a break, yeah, exactly. so um, grab breakfast if you didn't already. Um, if I can, yeah, 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 I think we probably have time for questions yeah. either individually or as a group. You made the comment in response to the village question that it doesn't take everybody being on board all at once or yeah. sort of a, a like pretty that. big village is better than a like village of four right, <laughs> right. yeah yeah so we have a pretty big village but it's yeah. not 100 yeah. percent. can you talk a little bit more about how that works when it's not 100 percent of people kind of yeah. buying in or fascinating thing actually so uh, so I, I just want to be so when i am not uh doing medical education i work in the women's health center in cambridge so my, I, I can go like my, the entire, I'm the only male in the entire place. Um, and and that, that's, that's good for you. That's, that's healthy for you. And the thing that um, I will say is that you learn a lot of things that might not have been the things you would have necessarily learned going through a life like this. So one of the things I'm quite attached to are, are sort of feminist um, moral development theories, feminist educational theories, feminist political theories. I like these things very much. And one of the ones I, I found very powerful way back in the day was this one. So how many males does it take in a classroom to change the dynamic of the classroom? So if you have a half and half, male, female, it, it, does the classroom, is the classroom different than if it was, I don't know, two-thirds female and one-third male? Like what does it require, what is needed to have the females act fully openly in a classroom according to their own standards and that of a teacher? So how, yeah, how many male? That's the one. answer. Yeah. So you throw one male in the classroom, all of a sudden the whole dynamic is ruined. Um, and it's not just a blind appeal to women's colleges and women's universities, but I think it's very, very interesting to think about that. So if you hold that as a notion, which has been demonstrated apparently a couple times, including even up as high as law school, like even at elite law schools apparently, how do we think about that and then in a community, a village that wants to make change? Is that, is that the statement also true in change making? So is it, could we have 99% you know, of the school ready to go and one person not ready to go and the whole thing gets bogged down? So the answer is largely, quote, it depends, right? And it depends, it depends on leadership, and it depends on what um, the people who are avowed, avowed to making the change care, care about. I realize I'm having a bit of a jet lag blank out here for a moment, but there's a, um, I'm just, I'll, have to, I'll get the term in a moment when I think of it. There's a term in social psychology for this phenomenon, which is that people um, have a perception of other people's beliefs and their perception of other people's beliefs changes their view of their willingness to hop into a discussion, argument, debate, or to dissent. So it's not necessarily that the other people actually hold those beliefs that matters. It's that I perceive that they hold those beliefs that matters. So, for example, you could have 100 people, right, where none of whom held an idea, but all of whom thought the others held the idea. And the consequence is nobody would speak up or stand out or, or disagree or be a rebel. When, in fact, they're in a perfect alignment. That, that's how powerful this effect is. So in some circumstances of change making, it turns out that only a few people can like, stem the change. Thankfully, this is not the case in the Dweck thing. All right? So I, it, when we get into this next session, or even the one on, um, on, like, on Friday morning, I think, we will have to think about like, what it takes to create change, what it takes to stop change. That's, that's important. That wasn't what you asked. You asked about the, the Dweckian or educational theory thing. If the general weight of the uh, curricular leaders is, let's say, towards the growth mindset and the language that goes with it, the students know about that. The materials are like that. Most classrooms function like that, right? Not all. Most preceptors have some, are, are, good, are okay, good, or great at it. Not necessarily all great. You're fine. 
Because what starts to happen is learners will have that be the normal thing mm -hmm. and the other be the not normal. You flip into what's the standard and it's okay to have things that are outside the standard. And frankly, if we're gonna hold true dweck on this, those who don't yet teach according to dweck just don't have it yet, right? Mm -hmm. Even in change making, one of our friends, um, Paul Worley, is the, was the former dean of uh, uh, Flinders University in uh, South Australia. This is probably the mo one, one of the two or three most socially accountable schools in the world, an absolutely brilliant school that he led. Um, so when he was doing this big transformation moment along with the faculty and students and everybody else at the school, there were a couple of very powerful chiefs who just did not, were not game. So his notion, which, with which I strongly agree, is you, you run towards the challenge, not away from the challenge. So he tells this very funny story. It's, it's such an Aussie story where he invited this chief of, of one of the departments to his shack, that's their word for like the cottage on the shore, um, to the shack down the peninsula in South Australia. And he and this chief kayaked that day, surfed that day together. They, he couldn't stand this guy, <laughs> right? It, it, he had him another time into this vineyard together and they had this, like, sat around. Talk. He did not like, Paul did not like this guy. But Paul just kept running towards this guy. And he did it not because he was trying to be manipulative or sort of trick the guy into agreeing. He did it with, if you ever meet Paul Worley, you will see. He did it with this authenticity. This guy, I'm, I know I like this guy. I just don't know I like this guy yet. Like it was like, I'm gonna, we're going to find commonality. And this guy may never come to like me, but he's going to come to respect me because I'm not going to relent on my engaging. Bang, bang. I mean, like, like story after story of his like going towards the descent. Um, I think about the U.S. right now. We're exactly the opposite in the U.S. right now. And I'm not saying this from some Cambridge, Massachusetts point of view. Like, right? My family are coal miners in southwestern Pennsylvania, so like I get it, right? So I, I think in regard to change making, there's one way of answering the question you're posing, and in regard to the essence of lear learning, I mean, the students become normed towards a certain mode of learning, a cadence of learning, an ethos of learning, it's much more hopeful. The, I think the hard work really is in the change making descent scheme, not in this pedagogical, like we don't all get this yet. The good Dr. Jones. I wonder if you could talk, David, about the difficulty that students have, that residents have, that we all have, because we're asked, we compete for medical school on the basis oh. of performance. We right. compete for residencies right. on the basis of, and so forth and so on. And so then the challenge is, and it's so consequential and it's so hard to switch mm -hmm. to a growth sort of attitude. Right. And back and forth and back and forth. Because if we don't perform, we don't advance. That's right. Until you see your patient and then... Sorry? I said, but the gift we have in medicine is that, until, that the patient can quickly make that switch, I think. So I should have... No, no. Dave answered that question. No, 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 no. But I think that, you know, I, 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 I think that's true when you're thinking about becoming a better tennis player where you advance to the next tournament because you've won all of the ones and there's no, but the altruistic piece that's required, I think, makes it more hopeful that they can make that switch. When we say, we've been trying to jump, you've jumped 95th percentile since kindergarten, and now the only metric that matters is the outcome of the people that you care for, then it, it, it can be, that it can focus. switch. Well, but that's a performance, that's performance, that's performance yeah. as well. I, I, I think, I, I think I, uh, my yeah. point is that if you don't compete, and com if you don't perform, you don't get the residency yes. you yes. want. If you don't perform, you don't get the fellowship you yes. want, and so forth and so on. And yes. then when you get into the clinical arena, you have to switch. You yes. say, no, it's not yes. about performance. I want to look dumb. I want to ask questions. That's, that's I think a non-trivial I know I, Challenge. I, I agree strongly. I, I do want to say, I have, I, so you're going to have to just have to forgive me later or get mad at me later. I do want to say that some, one or two or three of the most transformative conversations I've ever had in my life are with that man. And the article, the Roar and Pashta article, you yeah. forwarded me for no reason. I'm not in peds. I don't have the skills you have. You were a dean. I was some schmo. And you thought of me, and you took that article that was sent to you, I think from somebody at Penn, and you forwarded it to me. Yeah. And it just like, that was like a huge thing in my life. Doug Jones. Like, I, I do not get to do anything. But, okay, so. I don't you. think so. I know so. So, um, so thank you for that. And, and I will try, therefore, to answer the question with some degree of, of utility. So my, the way that I would answer it through the lens of the science, I'm, I'm going to try to re restrain my desire to answer it sort of in my own uh, way, is this. If we can um, suspend the performance driver, 
if we can suspend it and go all in on the just growth thing, your performance will increase. It actually, so ironically, you actually are getting the outcome by not seeking the outcome. So I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give an example. If you can please forgive a sports metaphor, is it okay? Because I have three boys and they play soccer. Is there anybody who would be offended by a soccer metaphor as the Women's <laughs> World Cup is about to start, right? So th this is very interesting for me to observe. The two coaches who coach my, my little boy, who's 12, um, have a particularly wise, I would even go so far as I just brilliant approach. In 12 year old, they're on this team, they are having the children do a much more difficult task, which is, quote, play the ball out of the back. What does that mean? It means when there's a, a so called goal kick, the ball's gone out of bounds, the goalie's gonna kick the ball. What most 12 year old teams will do, and it's much, it's much better for winning, is that goalie will kick the ball a great distance down the field, get it out of the like, defensive area, get it away from the goal, right? That's not what their team will do. These two guys, one of the guys played for Stanford, the other guy was a professional in Europe and then in the US. They said, we're gonna play soccer the way it's supposed to be played. We may lose games. It may look silly, but we're gonna play soccer the right way. The right way is you put that ball off right near the goal, and the players have to work that ball out of the back, work it across. So the entire fall season, by the way, we're paying a lot of money to be on this team. He's, a, he's, he's an elite soccer player, my little guy. He's really good. And this is like a pro development team. He's not gonna be a pro. But just, but just he's enjoying it, so we're doing it. So at the beginning of the year, like, wow, we're paying all this money, they're losing all these games, and they're looking ridiculous, <laughs> right? Like they, 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 like the goalie would put the ball out there, it scored. Like, we had the ball, and they so it scored, right? And the other parents are kind of just all getting edgy, because for them, it really is a life or death thing. They're trying to get their kids yeah. out of hard situations. We're like the like lucky family who just gets to have fun. So, so this goes on and on. And you know, over time, they would get the ball a little further up, and a little further, they, would, they would start to work. So now in the spring season, they beat everybody. Like nobody can touch the team, same team, the same exact team. In fact, we lost players. And the other teams have all, the, these other elite teams all have their same players. But now just, we just beat them, because our kids can play soccer. They suspended the trying to win. They, they weren't trying to win. They weren't trying to prevent goals. They weren't trying to do what was necessary right then to like look good. They were trying to like get great at what is supposed to be done. So I'm gonna contend without evidence, but just based on educational science, that if we actually are all in on the doing it right, we may not look good in the intervening time. We may not even, we certainly won't feel good in the intervening time, but in the end, you'll be more elite and you'll end up at Hopkins, Colorado, or who knows where, right? Yeah, I mean, I buy it completely. The but the time. message to the students, yeah. is, I mean, the message, if they don't do well in step one, step one they don't, you know, in step one. Yes. So I think so. One thing that step one thing I find fascinating too, because we can. I, I thank you for raising that, because we can also do. Um, what's the word? We can make binary two things which are separable, like we were doing earlier with this question of cramming, right? So the separable things are the getting better, so I can serve these patients with outstanding clinical excellence, or getting better, so I can do research excellence. Whatever it is you're supposed to do, that's one thing. The other thing is doing well on tests. Because sadly, our tests in medical school situations aren't a great measure of whether someone's going to be elite clinically or elite in research or in public health or whatever. So we can be, we can be, Harvard is actually doing this now, which I feel quite good about. Um, they're just saying to the students, you have to do really well on these tests. Here's how you would do that. We will help you. That's one thing. It is not the thing. It is something you have to do. The, th the real thing, though, is you have to get great at this clinical stuff, research stuff, public health stuff, whatever the other, you know, the, the clinical essence is. We will help you with that, too. And a lot of energy is placed on this, making them clinically more skillful and helping that along. The idea of trying to conflate those is a huge problem. Because when you conflate those, they will fall, just like Dr. Jones is saying, they'll fall back on the test. Because they can demonstrate that score. It, it forces a performance mindset. Right? right? So, so I, I can talk about education design. There's actually educational design moves you can do to make this separation more clear, along with how you, how you verbalize it. We can talk more about that. But that's, that's one, that's another move, is to be sort of transparent. Can I do one more a binary? Here's one. You have to become really, really talented and skillful to serve humankind. And that, that's like a school's duty, is to make their students skillful to go serve humankind. That's another duty of a school. They have to place really, really well in residencies. Right? And are those the same? Those are also sadly not, not closely linked. Right? A school's duty to get its students matched up would, might, be, might, might cause, even inadvertently, like covering up stuff. 
letters that are too hyperbolic, grades that are too inflated. There's all sorts of like moves to have your students shine to go get great residencies. But that's not about whether they're actually clinically good. And that's not about helping humankind. So schools also might do better to separate this idea of getting them their residencies like, and getting them really able, right? So I think if you're only playing out of the bath, the soccer metaphor, right? We, at some point, if the time runs out before the team gets really, really good, you've actually harmed your students in some ways, right? We have to do both. I just wouldn't conflate things that are not the same thing. It's dishonorable in, in, a, in a funny way to, I mean, to ourselves and to our students because we're sort of suggesting that the funny business of residency getting or even the funny business of test getting, good, getting good grades on a test are the same as this much more complex, lifelong task of being clinically skilled. They aren't, they aren't the same, actually. So I think it's better if we start pure about that. That's a question. You mentioned that you share at least WEC, but I think probably other components of this with your students. Um, and I, I heard that as being um, that you were very explicit about it or yes. help define the theories or talk about how it's a part of what they're doing and encourage that. What are some of the more common areas of um, either misunderstanding or pushback that occur? I'm just curious from your experience. What do you predict? These, these are kind of cool because these questions are these questions are linked. I like this. What do you predict? I'll, I'll answer. What do you predict? The government students get kind of, like they don't totally buy it, or they, they, they feel like they can't do it, or it's, it's too hard. Or... The, the grade part. The... Yeah, what does the grade part do, though? What is, how, does it, how does it undermine the part? Like... So the grade part is here, right? It's that you don't, you, it's here and it's there. This idea of not showing your weakness, right? Because right, we're making a whole argument. I'm trying to make this whole argument about, no, no, no. I, I, this is the, the, literally the language I use. I say, you've got to fumble and bumble. You've got to embrace the clunk. I always use the expression, embrace the clunk. I was like one of the most like, meaningful things in my life of education just happened. A student wrote, it was like the essay winner in academic medicine on a piece she called Embrace the Clunk. <laughs> like crazy. Um, so embracing the clunk, this idea like, oh, I just totally blew that. Um, we have that be sort of not a heavy down pull, but I, like, all right, got this. But here's, what did I mess up? Why did I get that? Like, where was, who do I ask for help? What did I not see? So to this earlier point, this sort of direct conversion thing is hard to do. Because even if the school is vowed to it, the next class of students are coming in, again from these colleges, right, which are saying exactly the opposite message. They're saying this top MCAT, top grades, this sort of performance, 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 fixed mindset. So the, from my lived experience, I can't speak to others who are engaged in this work, but from my lived experience, it's just very hard to get people to feel open about their frailties and mistakes and have that be a nourishing phenomenon. Thankfully, over time, that's, that's, you can get at that. And students are often extremely grateful if they've had a sort of conversion, like they've sort of gotten closer to. That. I've had many students write, for example, um, like years later, you later in med school, but even into residency and beyond, where I said, oh my gosh, it was so annoying at the time. But I've been working ever since at trying to just, right? Well, if the people wrote me this, I, I got a text once that said, I'm dwecking, I'm dwecking, I'm dwecking, after a person had written this wonderful paper that was rejected. All the, all the reviewers loved it, and then it was rejected. And she was feeling really bad about that. But she was using this sort of framework, I'm trying to do the work of like sitting in the... Um, so I think that's a very hard and very cool question. But I, I think people can do like test enhanced learning. They're just, they're just, they'll give it to it because it, it makes them feel like I can do better on my tests. Mm. They'll buy into spacing and interleaving because they're so relational. Mm. Like a lot of LICs are so relational that they buy into that, right? Um, even, even the di desirable difficulties, they can sort of, they, they've been athletes and elite piano players and all these things, so they can sort of even buy that. Although that's, that's a hard one too. But I think it's this, like, expose, exposing frailty is the one that is the most most vexing still to this earlier point, the village point. So I'm wondering about the issue of safety. I love the way you pulled out USMLE and you know, testing that's final um, and put it in its box and then said, but what's the real stuff is the growth mindset. But I feel like 
you put yourself in the shoes of a student, it creates a very unsafe environment, particularly in an evolving curriculum reform time. Yes. Because how do they know who's who? That's how do right. they know which evaluation system is on them in any given moment? And particularly when we have a situation where we don't have everybody bought into That's it. Right. Some people who can't even imagine what a growth mindset would be. How right. do you, because there's no learning without safety in my experience. Oh, that's right. So how do you keep that safety in, in that way of working? Yes. Okay, just for, that's, I think this question is also very nuanced. I, I, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer one thing about the learning without safety things. It's very interesting. If you define no learning without safety as being like something is frankly unsafe, that, that statement is for sure correct. It turns out that under some degree of tension and some slight degree of unsafe, but where there's a net, you actually, learning gets better. So there's this fascinating thing where if it's, if it's not uncomfortable at all, you can learn something, but you will not maximize. If it's across some line of, of unsafe, it, it, learning is dramatically imperiled. But in between those, there's the, it's, I'm a little edgy, I don't know about this so much, but there's a net kind of thing. That's actually, the, that's, that would be us in the green zone of Vygotsky. So I just, I just want to sort of play with that for a second. And the second thing is, so um, what, what curriculum leaders do in practice and in words has to match sort of the actual visible scheme. So let me tell you what, Harvard did two things. Please hear me, so I didn't attend Harvard Medical School. So I don't work for the alumni office, I'm not trying to raise money here. <laughs> um, but so I'm not, I don't wanna like say like Harvard did this or therefore anyone else should ever do it. I just wanna explain because it's one place I've had experience and it might be interesting. So they got rid of grades not only in the first year, which is their, the entire core science pre-clerkship year, they got rid of grades in their second phase, which is their core clinical year. They call it the PCE, or the Principal Clinical Experience. So there are no graded courses until the third phase. That's beyond the core clinical year. And even then, um, there's very little, there are very little graded, there are a few graded elements. Students will get this thing called a DSA, a department, it's basically it's a, a kind of holding grade. I'll just explain, I'll give you the language, the holding grade where they'll have a grade in internal medicine and a grade in one other thing. That's the only kind of core clinical grades they get except for their electives and, so, and sub-internship. Why? Turns out we surveyed the country and residency directors, to an incredibly large degree, basically look at their field, say like pediatrics and internal medicine. They have much less sort of interest in the rest. So Harvard basically said, we'll give you very, like, to the degree possible, we'll give you authentic grades in the things you want like the things you actually want. And we're not, gonna, we're not gonna have students in their second year who did their first beginning on surgery have that surgery grade define them. I can get much more into the grading later, but the point is they made an actual grade change to uphold the principle they were espousing. I'm happy to get into the details of the grading system more, but I just wanna, they, they actually did what they, were, what they were saying as a cultural notion. They give a blanked out space and time for studying for part one and part two of the boards. None of this like, We'll give you a few weeks, but while you're also still doing classes, which of course drives the students to do the studying during classes rather than the classes. Mm -hmm. They said, you will do your core clinical year as a whole, then you will have nothing to do for three months. Our recommendation is you do one elective in that time, but you could spend all 12 weeks if you wanted studying for the, for the board. You'll be wasting four weeks of your life. Leave it to you. The school recommends doing six weeks of studying. They said, you, you know, or eight, whatever. They say, don't do 12, but they don't, nothing happens if students do 12, but they have, like, there is nothing to do for, their, for those weeks prior to. So students don't ever have the sense, like, I won't have enough time to study. And the students in the year above can tell the students in the year below, oh my gosh, there's way more time than you need. Consequently, they don't have to be studying for boards while they're doing their core clinical year, and not studying for boards during the, during the phase before either. The structure, the structure speaks out. You have time for the test, you have time to do clinical, right? So the, the, the super structural answer I'm giving you is, um, your stance, your structure, and your practices must be aligned, right? So, so like the, the, these, these notions of the school, the ethos, whatever, the avowed terms, the visions, all these things, the way you set up the actual intra-course, cross-course, cross-year, cross-years structures, and then, the way, and then the way we are in front of students and with students, role modeling, mentoring, pedagogy, all that, should have to be aligned. As soon as you get male alignment, it's exactly as you suggest. Like, people start to smell it. If I can tell, here's a dirty laundry one. Um, I don't want to over-talk the answer, but there's a dirty laundry one. The first year of doing this at Harvard, the students believed that there were actually shadow grades. 
but they were in fact being graded, as they weren't being told the grades, right? And when they come, there's, there's, there's only two um, things in the universe that are really, really fast. The speed of light and a rumor at Harvard Medical School. Right? <laughs> so, so that went like, that was like, all of a sudden the entire school was on a meltdown. So we did, the school had to do a lot of like work. Um, but now what happens is the school has all of these, it's not really Orwellian, but it's sort of interesting. They have all of these processes whereby they make sure that leaders who are in front of students that are characterizing things have the spoken words the same. They have like the notions clear so that we can sort of continue to have the ideas be penetrated for people who are applying to the school, who get into the school, who arrive at the school for the first course throughout the whole first year. It's the same language of the stance, structure, and practices. Orange juice, water, break. Great. Restrooms, hang out, yeah. Is that, is that good? Yeah. yeah. Great. 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 I don't know. Okay. Oh, that's a problem. I was. I mean, we're thinking about Okay, I can totally look and see what people are finding for it. Um, oh, okay. so running the health center for all the students. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 it was fun. It was cool. Yeah, yeah. 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 right. We, you know, starting off, As you were did, saying, right, some people have yeah. Yeah. Well, some yeah, we did some pediatrics yeah. early on. But, yeah. but you know, even yeah. in, um, yeah. dealing with the 18 to 22 year olds, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the primary population. Um, it's not quite the same as you do. I'm a rheumatologist. So, oh, oh so maybe you are. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, spine is very. Um, yeah, you have a different uh, skewed. angle. Or, yeah. Skewed, but. Um, but yeah, interesting. Yeah, to think about that. I know. And I, and I have teenagers, one in college or whatever. Yeah, I, I don't. I take a break from the health services. <laughs> she goes to college, not my. Older oh, okay. Space. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, how do you. I mean, I know they want to have, including there's this thing that's going to happen in Hong Kong. Yeah. I'd like to figure out how to do the. I've got yeah. more time on my hands. Yeah, well, that would be I don't really need yeah. to work, but I don't want to just like go right. around the world. Right. Yeah. 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 right, well, that would be nice. Yeah. So, have you? do you know yeah. either Shanta or Jen Adam? No. I'm okay. So, so, I can introduce you to like the Shanta and 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 She's an um, adult. She's basically 
And then that's Joe. And that's Doug Jones. Yep. So he was the department chair. Okay. Probably if you had any in the past. Steve Daniels is the current department chair. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and he, uh, yeah, step back. I, I think it's yeah, this is his whole agenda. Down. So for this is sort of his agenda, but in terms of there's this workshop about LICs, however long at 10:30, and then he's got one on like just one on one for the rest of the day, and then tomorrow. Um, yeah, no, that I think he's okay. Okay, yeah, or some want something nationally. Yeah, so very very involved. Yeah. And then Jen Adams, um, who's in the green. She is, yeah, she's a general, uh, general. But I was pretty bad. So, and she is overseeing. Yes, so, yes. And then we're going to bring her to take care Okay. Which I presume is one of the reasons she's brought here. No, it's great. She runs the Denver Health Care Foundation. So, we have three LICs here now. Um, yeah, LIC is the Gen Starter Person. Now, the school is every student is going to be in the school. David is going to talk about now because he started. Oh, yeah. Where they would be. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So, okay. and we won't, so we're kind of, we're moving our, across. This uh, is no, rather than being showed at Rather than doing it, no, can you I know he's right. worried about it, but he probably is. Okay. Oh, okay. You're the entire kind of year, and you have a pre each group. Yeah. But the rest are um, like due to meetings, and I have to print their bios. And so, okay. I'll figure it out. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh huh. I'm sure but just the rest of the day curve of like, you don't learn as quickly as you do so much at one time. I'll just send them to the class. Much better. And eventually the outcomes are awesome. So, so people, if you don't uh, oh, have your final ICs if you aren't a fan of them. Like, the first time oh, I was in the year, like, oh my god. It all makes sense, right? Yeah, and it does yeah. make sense. And, yeah, I'm the clerkship director for Yeah, I mean, Well, that's a really good question. Um, let me see. I don't like this. I can't keep I, I am totally good at it because I cannot hear uh, uh, workshop. Yeah. Oh, who are you then? Yeah, that's what happened to all of us. Okay, cool. Well, then, can you email me? Oh, right. Because I've already got it. I have two pens. So, I'm going to try to put the data past year called Knowledge Base or KB. So, where and all we've been through here, students, like the first time every time. Sorry. 20 minutes in the night. Kind of cross out these phone numbers here. Everything else is, I can still. Oh, it doesn't, even, it doesn't even have my email on there, though. And the EKD was one of these third-year students. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least for now, I'm uh, renting. Like scheduled and every other. Some of my texts coming in this morning have to do with buying a place. The, oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. I know, yeah. So we'll see. They're all going to get lost until the recent last one. I'm trying to decide. Organizing these 20 minutes. I could go anywhere. Well, except I have two kids in the house. Students, the first-year students work with one of them. Yeah. Now, fourth-year. You're flexible. Second year. Saying this is how we want to do it. Well, thanks so much. Oh, I'm hoping we get to interact more. I mean, yes. I've got to introduce yeah. myself really to those cool. Yeah, I'm just wondering. And I can I go with that for sure. I'll have a question. Because I, I also have a, I have a, um, and the, what, 
the fourth year students were saying is, is how much it solidified well, their so knowledge. Yeah. In this new light so line, I you have to give um, a talk about education. I was captain for Health Startup Week, and I was a panel called East Meets West in Healthcare. You know, I can't do neurosurgery. Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh my God. No. <laughs> it's essential. I mean, yes. the patients do it. And, Absolutely. And, but it's all over the world. Oh, it I mean, is. Boulder may be easy. But I don't really know. Mm-hmm. And then, but, you know, two weeks in a great, two um, sessions you can understand row, what acupuncture first year and students said, we want EKG. And, oh and, and, and what was important about that is that it wasn't the third year saying, this is what you need to know, right? The first year's telling them. Yeah. I saw what that someone brought me with their shirt off the other day. Yeah, and they had their spots. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't know about, they don't know about us. Right. We don't know about them and how to, like, this interleaving of different disciplines. Totally. That would be important. I don't, yeah, that's a, that's actually a really good question, how that fits into well, our curriculum here. I don't know. I remember that, actually, in medical school. No, in medical school, I did have it. I did you? I think do, I had a half day or something. I, it, it maybe wasn't a lot, but I do remember learning about things, and maybe it yeah. stuck yeah. out because it was so interesting. And that maybe being a psych major, too, I remember talking about the psychology of health and, and the positive... Um, I did kind of um, having a positive so outlook and mm-hmm. can so cure things or whatever. I, I do remember yeah. thinking mm-hmm. about and homeopathy and things like that. Yeah. 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 Teach the first year that because I know we don't do peer yeah. teaching. Yeah. Yes. yes, right. And all the patients are exam stuff. You got to really kind of ask. Make sense. And I just kind of reflect on my right. own. Absolutely. Because otherwise you're not going to have a full picture of what they're doing. When I was a teacher, I was required to run the physical diagnosis course and the hospital psychiatrist. Yeah. Yeah. All that year, which and meant an hour-long hour long lecture, and then small group practicing, and then some form farming oh, yeah. the hospital yeah. to do their clinical methods. And if somebody didn't show up at the faculty meeting, then I had to fill in for that. But what it taught me was every week we were doing, oh, we're doing head and neck, oh, we're doing biofiles, oh, we're doing cardiac again, and I had to keep doing it. And one of the <laughs> feedback I got from my former students when I was, she was now an infectious disease faculty member, mm-hmm. but she was almost she wrote in my goodbye with so many words to tell you all of that. Thank you so much for but, being um, willing to hyperventilate yourself enough yet. to demonstrate the pulses paradox. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely remember, like, to that point, every student, when you say, check pulses paradoxes, they'll tell the patient, take a deep breath. And so, so I would say, like, so here's what's going to happen if you take, so I would take a deep breath until I would have a pulses, which would also almost make me pass out. Oh, <laughs> but it was impressionable to them, but I thought, like, this is the way of, of near, because at that time I was a near peer to them, basically. Mm-hmm. I was a president, they were my students. Um, I think having them kind of remember, you know, what that, what, how you can do those things, um, or what makes, what makes it real for you, we're, they're so much better at knowing that than we are. Yeah, absolutely. Are we living here? Yeah, we're in here. Okay, I got in some waters over there, so we're reserved. I just wanted to introduce you to John, who I just met. Hi, John. Hi, John. Thanks for being here. And he was the medical director at University of Colorado Boulder. Okay. And student health center. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Now you're here. Med students. Yeah. And now I'm retired, and now I'm ready to serve. Oh, Oh, fantastic. I love that. I'm really interested in medical student education. Actually, I'm... As we were talking about the first time. Jenny. Jenny. Yeah. yeah. Um, as we were talking about, I, even want, I would love to expand it even beyond that to how do we teach um, DOs, DCs, uh, ODs, acupuncturists, mm-hmm. rolfers, yeah. and how to integrate all mm-hmm. that education together. Because the patients are out there doing yeah. their, That's what we were just saying. Yeah. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. somebody might go see a surgeon and they get around a, a, a recommendation yeah. for a surgery, then they go off and, at least in Boulder, they go off and get four more recommendations. It is much more common in Boulder, yes. I can tell you. But yeah, <laughs> but the world's going that way. Yeah. And it's because, well, it's partly because we have families with them, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. I see, because I'm an ID doc, and I see people sometimes who have, the, have no infection, but mm-hmm. are looking for someone. Mm-hmm. And they will have been going to Boulder to get infusions of oh, yeah. immune hand enhancing things. Yeah. And yeah. I meet them because they get stuff of bacteremia from their line or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But the truth is, I should come to them. But we've been failing them yeah. because yeah. I haven't listened to their story, has, right. figured out what it is that makes them feel bad, or validated it, or said, I don't know. 
I asked the right question. Yeah. Or, or, or also I say, okay. I, I believe you that you feel bad, and I don't know how to make you feel better. Okay. Yeah. And that's so hard, and I know oh you've that in my rheumatology. Life. Oh my God, right? yes. And, and it becomes adult room. Yeah. You know, your pediatric yeah. patients yeah. become adults yeah. rheumatology mm -hmm. patients. Yeah. Totally. We can't fix them. Yeah. I, but I wasn't sure exactly we where that fit comment. into our uh, current uh, okay. curriculum as well as the future curriculum in terms mm -hmm. of thinking about we do East, have East, a West, complementary yeah. do it, medicine okay. oh, elective, okay. and then we have a little bit of it in our core content, but not okay. a lot. Yeah. Um, some uh, who's the person who's been pushing on this from the nutritional yeah. side we too. Do. We don't, of course, do like most medical schools. We do a terrible job at teaching oh, yeah. about nutrition. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's standard. I, mean, I right. use that as an excuse yeah. if somebody yeah. asks me a question. Oh, we talked about it. I don't know nutrition. <laughs> Nobody taught, taught me that. Yeah. I don't even know about it for myself. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How to talk to my patients about it. Yet, yeah. Because it changes by the week or month or whatever. Right. Well, but it's also that we don't do a good job of saying that is not my area of expertise. But I have Here, a part yeah. 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 who is a dietitian yeah. or a nutritionist who can help. Right. Right. Not my only cross hair, but that I, I really yeah. you know, yeah. think that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause, and it applies to other things. Yeah. 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 How you doing? Yeah, how are you? Good. 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 So we will seven the four years of birth card. Yeah, on the new curriculum, which I'll be teaching. Oh, I see. Okay. Probably have an LAC next summer. Just to work on it. Because that is what I think for the first year. That is our ability to see society and change things like that. How many people are in LAC? How many people are in LAC? I think so. I have a friend with kids right now. For the LAC. But when you start your own. I start with 12. Just out of the she's going to uh -huh. places, yeah. which mm -hmm. is fine. She <laughs> you know, can make her feel better, which is great. And if her child die from a cancer, like, what's happening is, so like, yes, we're failing right now, we're right now, we're okay. professional, okay. not as that our ability to show to be less than I can be specific. I mean, there are so different numbers, but very reasonable numbers. Do they do all four years? I'm just thinking all four years. I don't know if that's in the environment, well, that may not be quite in the, in my immediate way. It used to be that we have to go to community just said yes to the credibility. Right, that's another mind. Right, yeah, right, yeah. And that you can trust. Yeah, that I was able to kind of. Our inability to. Sort of get out of it. Actually, it was a little earlier. I'll just have to leave it earlier. And I've been to two previous meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Y
But yeah, the only problem about this meeting is it's in the polar opposite end of the metro area that we live in. Way down in southern Aurora, down off of 225 and like Island. Hours they have a yeah, senior yeah, 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 I'm also the chair of the IRB oh, study. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> semi, semi scientifically, at least try to study it. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Well, we yeah. are trying to them what are the data that we have now to get it all the basic things. And I'm assuming we can do it to try to say how we want to spend the outcomes about curriculum, which is really. 20 years out, right? Wow. Is that, you know, yeah. 10, 20 years out of that. What yeah. do the CU grad pack like? And more because we're to Medicaid later and we're not. What are the things that we want to see? It's really different. Most of our FDs are in Medicare. It's really growing. It was an awesome being. It's not going to be. Yeah. Right. And it's also societal. It's not necessarily Medicaid. I actually want to be physical there. I was very excited. I was like, I love it. We usually are in line with our SSOs. You know. Right. You got a lot of bang for the buck out of that. And yeah. Really yeah. Not, yeah. No yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Our relationship with CMS. I can put your email on there, you know, and then I will. Yeah. I can put yeah. your email. I, mean, I can put all three of our emails. And Mark's on the, 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 the council. council. When is that changing? I think it's better about that. Which might be there, too. I mean, it's easy. Okay. Okay. And it's CU Anschutz. But thank you for going. Edu. Yeah. And all of your Denver stuff is still there. I know. Well, okay. But when you reply, oh, it will say. Oh, it will say. Basically, I heard this question and answer something about it. You could, if they want to change everything, not send from. You can't say the lot. Like, yeah, tell all your emails. I think we managed to stay off some of the worst. Because I can't spell. I have a hard time spelling it. So I'm like, yeah. Look it up. He's passing the Of course, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, yeah. And you can look forward to sitting at the um, check. Yeah, there you go. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Again, through the Senate unanimously, we really put pressure on the House, on the Assembly. I love it. Yes. Yes. Which is, which is, which is, I do. I do. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking yeah, that needed to happen. Uh, yeah, but I have a number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. Um, that would have been a real setback. That's what I'm going to say. And the, the, um, uh, the reinsurance thing, although yeah. the forming a bill passed, yeah, yeah. the funding is still there. Um, I saw that on the top. I had a couple of meetings with Eric and Mel and then yesterday with Eric and Caitlin. That's got to happen. It does. It does. It does. I don't know who should hold it. I mean, the concern, and we we had a meeting. We're going to try to. Take everything that we've talked about and synthesize it. Yeah. 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 Oh, 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 with some Republican senators. Yeah, they were. And, 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 and you know, the, the tricky thing on yeah, here is, yeah. well, okay, fine, but where do you set the pricing? Right, right. Because, you know, the insurance companies can gain that. Right. You know, they can. Just not kind of. Yeah, they can control where that means. I know. So, but, you know, what we settled upon was not ideal, but we'll see what happens. Well, you know, again, it, doesn't really it will not. It will not have a scare. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Or even in division, how many internal medicine? I mean, it's usually emergency services and hospitals and stuff like that. Yeah.
um, you know surgeons, ED, the anesthesia, those yeah, are the yeah, groups that are really, you know, going to be really impacted. So it could have been worse. Right, right. Sessions, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it certainly cast a lot of attention on healthcare, which is a good Minnesota thing. Minnesota is so, doing it in the North Carolina, like yeah, totally yeah, yeah. yeah. recognized. Yeah. The other schools, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just yesterday I saw some yeah. national thing. I think it was on the yeah. you know, the Apple News thing about the Colorado insulin right. law. Yeah, you know? they're they're not yeah. they're not yeah. I think it's I um maybe it definitely the last Saturday. Oh, that did you see that email about the gun violence research <laughs> rally? Yeah. So, I did. I did. Yes. So the Giffords organization right. had reached out to the national ACP oh, office. There you go. So they oh, yeah. it's having these rallies in March. Right, right, right. It's just where still we have yeah. someone on the Senate who might be a swing vote. So it's, it's, still it's really easy. Really it's probably hard. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, hey, uh, yeah, 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 of course. I'm good. Yeah. The national ACP office actually wrote yeah. on the yeah. 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 And we're lovely. So it's like nothing I would, I mean, you know, really, it was well written. You know, somebody gave it to me a tweet a little bit. And so I went there and I read the comments. And then yesterday now, they gave it. Today they're putting it together. Those they wanted to go to the Denver Nice. 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 Yes. Why they're happening? Yeah. Yeah. Everything is. Of course, now like most of us all Yeah. Right. 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 Exactly. I don't see really see you know threat levels in Gardner. I know, I know. That was a staple of like including residency training. That's over ten years. Yeah, that's, that's I, mean, feeling yeah. like I mean, maybe it'll yeah. maybe it'll pass. Yeah. 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 How many patients yeah. are very yeah. There's like yeah. 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 There are yeah. still yeah. 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 Yeah
I just said I was better than what I did so much. It was just a little bit. I had to check that. It was a lot of time. Yeah, so you just took it. Like, I don't know why they had it. Sometimes they don't fit it. You know, like, tongue curls and other things. Good stuff. I know that about, yeah, when you when you send it on a topic, I'm just wondering if you do a follow-up, hey, thanks for talking about oh, these yeah, things, whether that gets talented or not. I don't know. I don't know. know. But I do remember him saying that if you didn't follow up, you would, like, it didn't matter. Okay. <laughs> and it didn't matter to him. All these were the rules. At first, I mean, he was, like, so <laughs> Right. I mean, I, I'm sure that's what happened, right? Is it was just, like, this thing. It's stuck in my head. You know, yeah. There is no process. There was never a process. One time, I don't think I was there for Lucia. Right, right, right. For AIM. I was coming back on, on the frontier, and I don't know how. Hmm, I wonder where we're going to land. The um, yeah. I was sitting in one of the oh, exit rows. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be a million times better. Since apparently our starting place is, it wasn't even the Michael Bennett floor. He was supposed to be next to me, but he never showed. <laughs> that would have been interesting. I used to see him often. The problem is, is like, you know, all of these guys are no way to know. And most of that stuff is like specialized stuff that only the other person. Yeah, so we're like, yeah, let's get it. Yeah. No, I think it's very hard. And he was, I think, I mean, we didn't realize this, right? He was a very hard worker. I've heard it. I have a good I'll find out the words pretty soon. I'll be there for that. We met with him personally one time. And, no, I think it was me and a resident, or me and a medical student. And you're right, he listened, and there was, I forget what the issues were. And there was one like, that he definitely didn't agree with us on, and he very politely <laughs> explained why he saw it differently. Yeah. 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 You know, she, you know, what wasn't oh adversarial God. about it, and allowed us to move on to the next topic. <laughs> No worries. Do you want us to move? Yeah. Do you want to move? The next year, you have to move up. You're really right. I want the back row. What row are we going to? This one? First or second? Yeah. First or second? Yeah. 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 First or second? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, no. no. Going going We're going to oh, yeah. <laughs> You did say first two rows, in all fairness. This is hard enough for me. It's driving me crazy. All right, front row. such a yeah. All right. So, um, I'm Um, more sort of luxury, but interactive. 
And then also, in large times, we just sit and chat and the days of the day and bustle together. So, in front of me here is, um, I will just give a few slides after this, just as sort of set up a framework. Maybe then we can start our discussion and then we'll, the rest of the time, we will chat. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So, the way, the way this one goes is that it sets up sort of how we got from, we should get into some moment of change through to having a lot of direct project, which is so strange and different than the way all of us, literally all of us, have done a lot of direct project. In fact, we didn't even have, we didn't even have a connection to this notion at all. Um, as I will try to convey on these two slides, it all arose from our sense of yeah, change and trying to define what was the change to make, why was that important change to make, how do you go from change to a model? So it kind of arose, for those of you who did the of the search, it was sort of an inductive, just grew out of the field, um, and then it was grounded in science. So if it's okay with you, I'll just do that. The short framework may be five and more, we'll have it in that book. Yeah. All right, I just want to make sure I thank Kathy for some um, adhere. I have, Kathy and I have sort of created this framework together, and then um, Kathy is the one who had the LIC in Minnesota. Um, you know, the edge more long. He is the one that um, necessary. All right, so just, I, I feel like I'm obliged to do one wordy slide of definition. Because we say longitude and intuitive clerkship, and there's a completely reasonable chance to say what? So, who <laughs> does the definition? The LIC is a clinical education program in which students, number one, participate in a comprehensive care of patients over time. So they're kind of doing all the stuff that they would be doing if they were doing block cultures. They participate in continuing learning relationships with these patients' clinicians. They are closely connected to their teachers. They relate to their patients closely, not wholly, they relate to their teachers closely. And they meet the majority of the year's core clinical competencies across multiple disciplines simultaneously as one through a location of the duration of the feet. This is a put this on a framework. Now there's a lot of pictorial ways to show that. The best way I think to show it, which I think I don't do here, but I did in the last talk was you can imagine a series of colored blocks, medicine, pediatrics, surgery, such as anthropology. You can take your blocks, I want to ask you to sort of make them into a stack of blocks. Yeah, it's a very important thing to do. We can take this block and just, oh, you just hold it down. So it's no longer block, it's this long yellow bar of medicine, this long yellow bar of peas, of neurology, of surgery, of what would you have, side So a series of colored bars. That is to say, you're doing multiple disciplines simultaneously over the course of the entire year, not synchronously. That's the end of the analysis. All right. So here's how we went from, like, gosh, there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of education, you might have to do a lot of them. First, we have this case for change. From educational and design principles that had to address the case for change. Our case for change, and I'll do this again on Friday in these webinars, um, rested on four notions. One was that uh, Abraham Flexner, in April of 1910, created the Flexner Report. All of the U.S. all of in our schools. I will say on Friday, I'll say here, the devil will quote Flexner to serve the devil's name. I'm not going to quote Flexner in that kind of way. Quote Flexner on page 95 of the Green Book, solidly on Flexner. Here's the argument um, on that earth. Um, the <laughs> yeah. argument that so students should be with their teachers over substantial time, the students should be with the patients over substantial time, and the students should engage in, uh, not on page 95, but close to their, they <laughs> should engage in, um, Addressing or caring for patients who have a core condition of coping with all adults. So he, he decided he didn't want that to happen, but to have students and family barely running into each other, students and patients having these objective like and brief connections that aren't really on the patient as a whole being, but rather just like a liver of the six. Right? Patients by the diagnosis. And he, he also did find this idea of hyper specialization. Um, because frankly, there really wasn't hyper specialization back in 1910. If anybody got sick, they went to a hospital. So the patients are the public health, but the patients see the hospital. We were talking about the fact that the U.S. was purporting to be very deeply about the frustrating principles and simply wasn't doing it. Students aren't connected to their teachers closely, not connected to their patients closely, and they aren't uh, engaging with patients in other conditions. Oh. That was one of our cases for change. Another case for change was 
There's a robust literature that I showed in the last presentation about ethical erosion, which in short is that students are actually at risk of harm from their clinical learning in medical school. And there's all sorts of studies using validated tools to show that students can find their patient centeredness, their empathy, their moral development. As a consequence of medical education, and primarily in the core clinical year, we've seen that with our students too. Barbara Booker and I were involved in this for a time creating a lot. She and I were sitting around one day at a cafe, cafe so that's what we doing here. She <laughs> didn't have a rain on right there. I was long so we were we had we had we were we were doing we were having a sort of mini retreat together sitting in the sandwich shop. And why are our students enjoy kind of life like people think about this? Enjoy that we don't want to be down and burning out of it. This is so meaningful and fun like that. And it occurred to us that part of the reason why we're having a blast and they're not having a blast is that we have meaningful engagement with our patients, and they don't. And we see our patients as like people. And they see them as something someone from what they learn, or like something that helps them on a task that they seem so objective by them, not by them. So we, like, we should be meaningful roles. We should be authentic roles. We should have a really relational continuity with our patients. So we're just musing together about the things that we love that we perceive the students are about. Turned out there's great educational science about this, but I was arguing for the following us, our case for change. The third case for change issue was that there's, um, if you look at needs in society, there are all of these needs that aren't being met by medical education. I can afford you to have an hour on this, but just in short, like there are areas of our country, or areas of our state, which are underserved. And this is true of all states. This is true of the <laughs> Which I think there are more doctors per capita in Boston than any city in the US. We have all of these underserved parts of our state. There are underserved disciplines, right? You're telling this pediatric rheumatology all over the world south, right? So, I mean, there are all sorts of underserved disciplines, even ones that are much sort of less particular than this one, right? There's not an OBGYN in the country. There's not a primary care in the country. There's not a primary care in the country. There's not a lot of general surgery in the country. There's not a psychiatry in the country or child psychiatry. There's a lot of things that aren't enough in all sorts of rural and other areas of the country. So underserved areas, underserved disciplines, there are underserved populations within areas that have tons of doctors. Austin has tons of doctors. Anybody has ever seen how that? Not very good. People are sort of part of the colors. Behind it's a pretty well covered hospital, a very normal hospital. Um, and so there's a little neighborhood really called Longwood down the street, the children's hospital, and down the street, uh, that is your home hospital and research labs. Now, but if you go out the back of the hospital, you will have moved out the door and walk directly through the very home visit, it's sort of thin there, so you walk through the hospital, but these steps. Now, if you're looking at a neighborhood which doesn't get health care, the neighborhood right there doesn't have adequate health care. Right? So that's the bridge we use much more multilingual and much more looking at the kind of places that, that community would go to. They're going to continue to not have health care in Boston. So we were, Barbara and I were kind of, you can imagine how this cafe meal is looking by this point, a lot more dirt and hot chocolate for me. And they come about the world, many stones down the back. And that's, that's bad too. Right? So we're getting all fired up. Right? And then we heard her to us, you know, are you know a lot of educational science? Courses. I don't know if that's an educator, but we didn't know as much educational science. We were in Hollis, like, two of Margaret's educators. We were thinking, is educational science actually grounding our educational model? Like, if we don't know anything, like, none of our friends know anything, probably not. <laughs> Turned out, our friends were also nice and well spirited educators who weren't really educators. They were just doctors who were doing education. Um, I don't purport to be an educator now yet, but I don't, I'm just suggesting that it actually is legitimately a big one. And there's all sorts of educational science in theory. It's very low because they apply to our education. Those are the four things about that we were thinking about. Consequently, we were kind of feeling fired up to be the case for change. I am not suggesting for a second that those should be your case for change. I'm not even saying you should change. I'm just saying that. If it is that you're thinking about change, it's clear that you can sort of know what it is that's bugging you, because that helps you know where you're going. And it's pretty clear you need to know, like, once you know what's bugging you, what are the things that you would do that would address those things that are bugging us? This would change the principle that will help fix that up the about the first step. The design principles are just the concepts you want to actualize and come up and they have to address the case for change. The model. That's the 
understands that continuous quality improvement. So the whole, the whole short notion of the short talk is embedded to that, which is the statute of government and why I'm going to follow into a solution. I would never tell you this way because I don't think those things are confusing, but there's actually a gap between the first two and the next two. So in here, in this sort of space, in this gap, there's process management. But to, to get your case for change, it can't be just have two different part of me ranting in some shop. Um, it has to get us to ideally a model or, or some change to make it. So in here, you need to go from those two to your process, kind of yellow and yellow colored light, cautiously. Then you process management very carefully. If you do it very well, and the IR kind of offered two ways that we thought about it, um, that will then get you with great uh, green light, green light to the rest of the, the rest of the situation. But just cautious, cautious. Right now, we're on the other end of the gray light. Yeah. People will be doing more. People will be wanting to invest in that. People like this might be a bit more at the current time. Um, right, that's part of the process management. It's a relational moment. So that way. All right. So on the side. There are Cotter, John Cotter's eight steps is one way of thinking about change management and also this notion of key questions. So I'll just show you those and I'll talk about you today. Okay, so I'll do the key, uh, I'll do Cotter. You don't have to read it, but I'm saying that's what page I want Cotter's book to show that he has this repeat that process of being each one of these two. I'll do each one of these two. So here are those eight steps. Uh, Cotter is a change expert who comes from Harvard Business School. I said in the earlier talk, I didn't attend Harvard University, I didn't attend Harvard Medical School, I didn't attend Harvard Business School. I am not a, I don't have a Harvard path, I don't have a Harvard teacher. Um, I do work there and I have lovely friends, so of course I don't have a Harvard But I'm not selling any Harvard stuff, just to say who he is. But anyway, he's um, going to argue this. You need to establish a sense of urgency, which has to do with like, why are we doing this? What, why does it do now? <laughs> You have to have people who are in the guiding coalition. My suspicion is this room is full of such people. And the word powerful is interesting. Powerful means two things. I think you must have people who actually have positions where they can be involved in decision making. And you must have plenty of people who may or may not be in decision making places, but who are evangelicals here. And the power of the group. Right? They think, like, yeah, that is broken. We should do something about that. Yeah, it's going to be meaningful to me in my life for a job where I can help build something. I really like my team. It's fun to work with this team. They drive me crazy, but it's really inspirational. We get to go somewhere together. That kind of sort of fire up the problem. That's another kind of power that we should make. Vision must be created, oftentimes co created, um, and that vision needs to be deeply, deeply penetrated. Many people use this as a brand of internal marketing. Like, it can't be that this is a vision for those people, the best people to buy in. Like, it needs to be like, everywhere. I recall, I recall the, um, the University of Missouri. And we were watching it, uh, their hospital. It, I, don't, I don't have this quite right, but it was something like, we mentioned this in all the Europe, it was something like, to serve the people of Missouri and beyond. Uh, the and beyond was kind of cool. This and beyond stuff all over the universe of Missouri. This is to serve the people of Missouri, uh, Missouri and beyond is everywhere. People talk about it, people know about it, they find, find the little bottom of their logo, it's everywhere. At some point, what do you believe? You believe you're trying to serve people of Missouri and beyond. But right? So this communicating the vision is important. So we're going to go. The power of others to act on the vision. It can't be just some secret call, coffee shop call, or any other call. It has to be that um, penetrate the change making processes and power stoppers, we would argue. You must plan for and create short term wins. So if the big wins of you and the equipment was finally launched six years from now, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Right? Um, Again, I'm not even advocating you to change anything. I'm just saying, in general, the change. People need to be feeling good as they go. So I, 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 my argument in life is chocolate as you go. Um, the seven, consolidate improvements that produce still more change. So some, if this idea of consolidate, it can't be that you just make a change. It has to be somehow planned in such a way that it, it will come on, it will continue to exist. But it's a taking care of things to deeply root it. Um, and then you move on to the next things. In the computer science world, um, there's this notion where they do, they do this rapid cycle innovation. And then you big success in two weeks, they plant that one, make the next big success, they look back and the last one is still secure, then the next one make the first two which still secure. There's always this kind of look back. And you're, you're just going ahead of things, okay? 
find the one institutionalized building approaches. So as you've done this look back, build, 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 things are actually continuing to develop and see and plan and go. And that was sort of quick and done. So that is kind of quite fun. They're a little bit for a lay public and they're not too much business speak. And well, they're all this. But whatever. I think they're good for learning change. There's a couple of good books about that. I, I think Connor is great. I'm a little wary of business models and they're kind of picky and cute. So I think Barbara and I love them. Those are more plain spoken. There we have the old method of thinking about change, management processes, and all of that throughout. So here's what we thought the classic question. So, what are the strengths and challenges to doing this, this model of case for change? Principles that will help adjust the case for change and make your model, the model, and then the CQI, if you use what are the strengths and challenges, and any of those stuff. Do the strength and challenges thing at the beginning, and do the strength and challenges thing throughout. And keep remembering like, where are the areas that are helpful, where are the areas that are, that are barriers, and keep working that work. That's one of the four options. Who should be on the team? And how do you help them realize the meaning and joy making that might be important? Again, that's only one time to do, as I, I do and read you all throughout. That's the original skeptics, just me walking out being some great leaders of the other around the organization. How will you garner resources for planning and innovation, or policy, or whatever you choose to make? Garner resources does mean money sometimes, but also importantly, you need time, or again, people who are excited by the idea. But there's lots of notions about the resource for people that don't want to have it. Have to consider. And again, this should keep going throughout. How do you address the internal market? What is the plan for engaging students and faculty in the dean's office? I'm just going to pause. Students and faculty in the dean's office. So it's not easy to stop So one group of students might be able to do it. Students are absolutely the way it is in school. Well, students will care. Keep the idea that we have not thought of. Students have a substantial one. Their future, and their school, and their school. And they also want to have a future as meaningful as that. Right? So there's all of these ways in which you say, there's no way that you could be entirely bought in. That, of course, is a very reasonable thing. I don't think to wish I had an expectation. I don't want to make sure it's all worked out. Not selfish, they're foolish. They're legitimate. Like, I'm working on working darn hard. I want to be able to mission. It better work. So you'll find lots of resistance in one which is completely reasonable. Right? And lots of fire up in this, which is also completely reasonable. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't not do processes within them among students. If you have student leaders, it's good to have that, them be an arm of any change maker. That is not telling the change, but doing this bi-directional like, consideration of what, where we ought to go here. The students are not, as an object to find out, students are like the student, the kid, those folks. Students are exactly us, just we went first. But I mean, there's no difference. We just have to be at your little cause as a couple of steps further, right? So, students, if I can give you that metaphor, that's true for faculty, that is true for dean's offices, there's, there's only one thing, the whole thing, one community, the whole community, to all be engaged and considered important for change. Um, it's especially important to consider those who don't share the good ones, the LICs or any innovations, right? And in the earlier talk, we might this one. It will have more cost for funding for those who might be I realize many people that you can't run the book, which is pretty not good for your health. He looked right at me. I have to believe that the person who's in this one would have to do it. I used to be like some value. I tried to figure out Pancake. One more thing. All right, there's one more question. All right. One of the sources of external support, how do you find out there's that? The government and some states. A lot of like Trisha does say government is kind of hard on funding, not budgeted. Um, there are going to be other very important national organizations who sometimes will then call the initially ambivalent external supports become less ambivalent. Our medical schools are literally bought into our change, but then there's <coughs> the double AMC, the New York Academy of Medicine. And um, the Macy Foundation of all were very into our thing. And those three things are all important too. <laughs> what? Let's go. What job training? What full time equivalent is required for leadership of an LSA? 
proficient LSD or the teacher in LSD. Like, what the org chart? I'm not saying the org chart is the chart that ends up being the final org chart, but that when it's all made. But for the moment, what, what, who is talking to who about what stuff? Right? You can't have a nebulous like leadership thing. I would say that you can't have an original one either. So, some kind of org chart. Imagine the institutional org chart, but it already exists. It's not, not epic. Not, um, not flexible. What do you think you sit? Where do the change makers sit? Where do the transformer people sit? That's the overall culture of the world. How does that affect the outcome? Finally, what is the plan for scale? If ever there were a school that I think the possibility of shining brightness, it is it here. Um, so it is true that um, South Dakota went from an LSD in charge to an LSD in whole. It is true that a couple of schools in the country start with an LSD as a whole. There will be no school of this size or of this prominence, or of some connections to the best information. I want to know if it's like that great, you know, finally across the country, and how it all comes from the country. Uh, there will be no kind of school that's really close to this, uh, that will have come out of partial to full LSD. So, you better think about this for a second. What does that mean? That means that I think it's kind of useful to use it as a religious, but I think it's actually a metaphorically entirely correct. There will be a bright light. Coming down from the mountains. Some ladies like, don't have mountains. Right? But there's no way that the place is looked at, people want to come visit. Like, you know, if the LCD comes around again, this will be a lot of me talk of. It will be a bunch of people that will come a lot of How about coming? All of a sudden. I'm not sure that we should necessarily have our whole our lives to the idea that, oh, like my medical center, my hospital, the whole most important thing is that we have the brightest light out of this. Well, in some ways. <laughs> on the other hand, if that bright light can really serve human triumph, okay, that's good. I think we should do that. <laughs> but, so if this improves the way learners learn and patients get treated by doctors, and the way our state can help have other states do the right and good thing for their learners and their patients in college, <laughs> then we've got a lot of it. Right? So um, the reason we think about what is the plan for scale and that I put here, or where not put here, was this. They can pilot in order to scale it. Pilot to scale, or you can pilot at scale. And it's actually kind of complicated. Some is going to be piloted in order to scale later, you never get to later. So, what person would have a lot of reason? Oh, I'm so far. What person would have a lot of reason to say that you're going to be careful and pilot at scale later? It would be odd. So, I will tell you happily in our discussion in a moment about how it is that I personally think that I can go to the point of all this. Um, we, we must have a huge, a huge way. Um, and I'll share. But it had to do with our belief about the ability to pilot to scale. If we piloted larger Harvard, we would have had all of Harvard doing it much, many, many more years ago. It's more than tell Right, finally, the last one. So here in our room here, and then the time that follows, we should be part of those first two steps, the case for change steps about what principles under the model. And that would us why we're going so far at all, and how do we get from the valid feelings to the model. It is the, the, some of the greatest fun of it is kind of this constant uh, invitation of questions and curiosity. Building things is, it can be incredibly fun and meaningful, even as it's also hard. Uh, and the curiosity and questions are, 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 are a large part of what makes the great innovations. Well, I was going to be out of the river. So you should continue writing the generation and testing. Shares, also reach out to the community to share. So, in the longitudinal integrated culture world, there are plenty of people who don't have longitudinal integrated cultures. It is really like the idea of relational education and addressing both boards and um, having change be a part of how education should go. And that community is a hugely sharing community. And once you meet them, I should, you know, it's like a, a word that's a little like cookie, puppy, and it's bizarre. It's called, um, people like, really love meeting new people. So, I would say this if you ever want to like, engage in people in the LIC world, just around. I'm very friendly and very sharing. Which can actually tell us anything more. Um, I think it's worth at least considering other other questions that I pose. So I have some schemes where you're also always doing the ruminating strategic management as you go. So the core one is that um, I fail to believe the ability of that ever is the ability of that non 
We can um, we can get into nothing bold if you like to it out or whatever we can help. Um, you guys questions about your own change moment or whatever we can help. We should we should just get in there. I am wondering for two minutes if it would be helpful to just do a quick run around the room to say Who's here? who you are and what your role is in LICs because I think um, this group doesn't all know each other and it might be helpful because I think people are different stages in planning LICs and involvement. Would that be helpful to everyone? Here. So I'm Jen. I run the Denver Health LIC. I'm Christina. I am the coordinator for the Denver Health LIC. I'm, I'm Shanta. I'm the senior associate dean for education, and we are moving towards all LICs. So, from the, this group is here to learn about that. Uh, Roberto, I'm a family doc, and I am directing and expanding the rural LICs. Randy Deppenbacher, I'm Family Medicine, and I am um, helping to create the Family Medicine content in the LICs here on the AMC campus. I'm Emily O'Connor, I'm the Phase 3 Coordinator. Uh, I'm Brooke Baker, I'm the Phase 3 and 4 Elective Coordinator. I'm Troy Kincaid, uh, I'm a second year medical student. I'm Tessa Hennessy, I'm also a second year medical student. Uh, Al Steinman, I'm the Chief of Academic Medicine in St. Joe's, a community affiliate, and we're interested in being one of the LIC sites. My name is Christy. I'm an internist. I'm working on starting to plan the LIC in Fort Collins, which is an hour north of here. Yeah, and I'm helping Christy do that. <laughs> I'm Suzanne Brand. I'm, like yourself. <laughs> uh, I'm Jenny Soap from Pediatrics and helping to oversee the pediatric components of the LICs and uh, specifically the ones here on Anschutz. And I'm Sarah Lesko. I'm the education coordinator for the anesthesiology department. Tom Kunzman, I'm recently retired medical director up in Boulder. And um, I'm just really interested in the topic. I have that zeal. <laughs> That's why I'm here. My name is Jack Cunningham. I work at uh, Denver Health, and I'm the inpatient medicine uh, liaison for the Denver Health uh, LIC. I'm Vishnu Kulasir. I work at the outpatient um, in internal medicine at Denver Health and the assistant director for our LIC. I'm Catherine Ard. I'm a former Denver Health LIC student and just graduated medical student starting residency here. I'm Sharice Arnold Rearing. I'm a pediatrician. I'm the director of medical education for the Colorado Permanente Medical Group, which is a hopeful future site for the LIC. I don't know. 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 I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that with the in the reasons why um, change was important from the traditional like um, clinical experiences for med medical students that there was a decrease in empathy and um, morality or I don't remember all the examples you gave but can you talk a little bit more about um, the problems with our traditional uh, clinical experiences and how you guys measured that those were problems? Yeah, so I'm going to say that I'll, I'll speak about our perceived problems with our because I think there may not be problems, but I don't want to have comments that are high carrier problems. Um, <laughs> so the literature, and, and it's going back to uh, there's a couple of sentinel papers, one was in 1992, but we don't want to put the literature over the end, it was in 1994. So, by three authors who wrote about what they called ethical erosion. It, it, unfortunately, although the literature that follows is brilliant, the title of Ethical Erosion is not the most helpful. It's not about ethics. How many beneficent? It's not about that. So the literature basically showed in 1994 that there was a, a lot of harm happening to medical students uh, in the six Eastern Pennsylvania medical schools. Following that, a series of authors using validated survey instruments, okay, well validated survey instruments, showed a decrease in patient centeredness through a couple different tools that were used. Um, and the main loss of patient centeredness was in the core of the era. And you can talk about the 
That that's in the core of the the third year of this world. The car video is the second year now, it just includes in the third year. So that's just a good example of Calvin Childs group did that. Um, all the kids group did that. The tool is called the PPOS, and the tool is called the C3 instruments. We ended up using these instruments a lot. Then a series of different writers, um, Newton and a team in Arkansas, Hojak and a team at Jefferson, and others, they were using validated, pretty well validated tools for what's called vicarious apathy. And students would decrease in their vicarious apathy during the core, during medical school and principally in the core of the year. It's interesting thing about that gender in there too. Females they look like start higher in their apathy, and they fall lower. They start higher, so there's more to fall. And they fall lower, but they should bounce back higher. But both males and females fall across, across medical school and mainly in the core of the year. And then um, one of those like awful uh, to see studies was using um, Lawrence Goldberg's DIT scale, which is a DIT DIT scale. And it's one of the most validated tools in all of social psychology. And it's a moral development scale, and people in Canada, um, past my own colleagues, looked at it, applied this to students. It looked like students decreased in their moral development in medical education in the core of the year, even if you compare them to age matched years outside of medicine. And a series of authors went on to see like there's more reasoning linked to general confidence because the critique you might imagine would be, yeah, but so so the, who gives more reason? We want to make sure these people are confident. It turns out they code there, and that they were actually able to show, and I thought this was very important, very small to really show this notion, the fancy notion of like somebody's a really mean doctor, like he's just awful, he's totally mean, but he's the best building specialty here. This or that. But so you know, but you know, so that's, that's what's important. You know, the other hand, you might be like, oh, he or she is such a nice soul. Um, pretty good. And they're really sweet and kind. And, right? This idea that there was a mean person who was outstanding and a soft person who was not, who was, like, not as good, turns out it's incredibly wrong. Basically, there are people who are outstanding who are mean, people who are outstanding who are not. And, um, and on the other end of the spectrum as well. But what is interesting is they were able to show that people who were more morally developed using validated tools actually had even higher levels of confidence than those who were not. So you can be like outstanding and cool, nice, kind, introspective, reflective, and so forth, and like outstanding and not. And there's a gap between those two. So that was important in the moral development skills. Finally, the two, the two more things were um, that they showed that medical education, not other health professional education. That's just it's us. And there was in a, a, a series of studies in Texas and UCSF and others who showed that the harmful stuff that happens now predicts the harmful stuff that will happen later. And that was, that was before the burnout, depression, and suicidality literature is taken off in the last few years. That's what I think the old literature. So, I didn't know any of that when we were when I was sitting in the coffee shop, but I did know the lived experience where students didn't sound like So we did a plot, we did interview, we did interviews with traditional law students um, and residents. We applied one of the tools to them, to the government's tool, we applied another tool. Think about whether people prioritize patients as humans or patients as tasks to get done. So we were sad. So that was another way for us. And none of which might have lost you that we just have called out. Because others have been how well we were fired up. And you can judge by the all you want, see if you attend it or whatever, or whatever you're thinking about that. question, I guess, for the group, um, and I don't know the answer to this, but I guess um, your call, is it call for change? The, or, I, I think case for change. Case for change. For your change. case or motivation for change, all at least for me personally, resonates um, here. Um, and so, but I guess I was curious as a group to think about, are there things that are unique about University of Colorado that 
um, that if we were giving this talk, what would what would we say as our call for change? And it and it aligns with also what you were saying about, about the internal conversations. And so I'm embarrassed to say because I am involved and I'm like a hundred percent drank the Kool Aid and like on board with this, but I'm not sure that I could stand up with and give that talk to be able to say this is why we're doing this and be convincing. Um, across both our institution as well as uh, outside of the institution. So I just wonder if there are other people in the room, I'm looking at Shanta and Jen <laughs> particularly, but other people that could help with that, it, it, because I think that that is an important way to start. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. Uh, I think I can always point to Jen and say the Denver Health LIC is an example of what, you know, is. We've done a pilot that has turned into also a case for change to say, look what we have and look what we could have. Let's try to move in that direction. When I'm doing and I am trying, our goal right now is to have at least once a week um, a presentation to a group of stakeholders on the campus. So I talked to the Department of Immunology and Microbiology yesterday um, to do case for change. And last week I talked to the group of the department chairs for the fourth time to kind of tell them our case for change. And, and as Dave was speaking earlier this morning, I realized there are a couple of things that are not great about the way making case for change involves saying there are some things that we want to fix that are not great and means being more transparent about that to the rest of our group, including our students who are in the room, um, to say, you know, it's not to say we're not making, you're not becoming a wonderful doctor. It's that we want our whole school to kind of transition to making that better. And as I was mentioning to you, for society too. Um, and one of the things that study, you showed a study, for those of you who were this, earlier this morning, about a case for change in the early 1990s about the learning environment and about what students were observing that doctors or others were saying about patients um, that was really, really upsetting. And the graduation questionnaire that the AAMC does of medical students has some of those questions in it still today. We perform abysmally on that component of the, um, you know, of, of the survey. And the first time that I got to see that was in my first month on in this role. And it literally, when I opened it, made me cry. And I called the dean and I said, if this is how we're going to be, I'm not sure I can do this. Um, and he and I think there's no stronger case for a change than something that makes us as an education community who's also I agree with 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 David that when we see medical students, we think you are us. We are in this together. I don't think, oh, you're a student. We're doctors. I know you guys think of us a little bit differently, but we think of you as us. Um, and there's no, I think, stronger case for change should be for all of us in the whole world around medicine than to say our students, as they're becoming doctors, look at us and say, you don't treat patients well. Um, we, we can't let that be. Um, so being more transparent about some of those data might be helpful mm -hmm. and connecting it to the fact that our LIC students, not just in the Denver Health LIC, but in the Colorado Springs LIC and our ILMC that happens in the rural area in our VA, I, LIC all have a little more of the empathy at the end and protection. We say, oh, that's working. Something there is working to fix this thing that makes me so sad at night that I could want to resign my job, um, that that's working, so we should do more of that. Um, does that sound like a case for change? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't, I agree, I haven't maybe been as transparent about it to a bigger group, although I'm starting to because I feel necessary, it's necessary. Well, I just feel like having the elevator speech that we can all give or something you know, to be able to articulate it. As I said, I, I believe in it for sure, but I don't know that I could say it as well as you just said it or to distill it to four points that you made. Well, and Jen has great data and has also been going out to share that data because people hear different messages, right? Some people hear the story and that helps them. Others need the data and that helps them better. I um, mean, we have both. We have stories and data. <laughs> And well, I think I have a slide that, that I give to the students when I'm trying mm -hmm. to present to them and talk to them about what an LIC is that mm -hmm. presents a case for change. I'm not sure it's everything, but yeah. I think you're right, Jenny, that we need to have this well articulated. Yeah. Right. So yeah. why don't we work on that? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a great sort of takeaway from this. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Follow. It's just that all of the physicians in this room went through the traditional <laughs> third year. Except yeah. Catherine. 
Yeah, <laughs> except for whoever didn't. Um, but I guess my, my question would just be, in those experiences, what, what would the case for change be from your experience, even though there's a time gap um, of why maybe that wasn't the best way and maybe you would have wanted an LIC? I can tell you my personal reason is I hated going from one block to the next and not knowing what my attendings wanted from me. Um, I hated going from a rotation where a longitudinal relationship with a patient would have made more sense, like OB. Um, I wanted to see them at the beginning and then deliver their child. I wanted to take care of the newborn and then have them come in for the well visits. Um, and so I felt like I was losing a lot of the educational opportunities as well as having a lot of increased stress that was really unnecessary. Um, I actually loved it that way. So, so it's been very hard for me to say, okay, this is a medical school way. We're going to do it. And, and this is why, because I loved it. I loved all of it in the third year. And what has for me been a connector is that like, well, why I'm an okay doctor, right? So why not do blocks <laughs> um, is because medicine has changed and the way we practice medicine has changed. So patients, I had patients on my medicine team and I had a longitudinal relationship with them because they were in the hospital for an entire month. And I had a longitudinal relationship with my attending because my attending was also in the hospital for the entire month. And so was my residents and we, none of us had any days off. And so we were all there together and we had a great time. We went out to dinner um, at the end and I stayed connected to them throughout medical school because we made such an amazing relationship. That doesn't happen anymore because patients only stay in the hospital for 2.7 days at the longest. Um, and um, our attendings change every week or every two weeks if you're lucky. The residents have days off. The teams are not all together in the same place. Um, and so there are a lot of different changes. And medicine is changing more to the outpatient world. So I could have learned to be a really good inpatient doctor, but I would have been a terrible outpatient doctor based on my medical school experience. But that's not how medicine is practiced anymore. So we have to change because the way medicine and healthcare are being practiced has changed. It doesn't make sense for us to teach it in the old way, even if we loved it. Um, but, and Brandy's points are, I think, very true and were true for many of my classmates. Um, but I felt fortunate that we had to, you know, we had more of those, some of the longitudinal things that happen and are important from the LIC don't happen organically almost ever anymore um, the way they used to sometimes if we got lucky. I, mean, I also think looking at it kind of from the other side, you know, I've been involved in medical students for over 30 years, and a lot of faculty, it resonates with a lot of faculty, there's something we do to medical students in the third year <laughs> that changes them fundamentally, and it's always dismayed a lot of faculty. And what really resonated with me here was that thought that, gee, maybe we could do that differently and not ruin them as people <laughs> as we make them doctors. <laughs> I think anybody who's been working medical for a long time recognizes that. There's something that happens at that point that's that's not good. They get a lot of good stuff, but they also, something changes. Different angle on both of your questions is, um, is there any Colorado data, I mean, there's, anybody in this room can talk anecdotally, but is there any Colorado data that talks about how the patient perceives the doctor or the outcome of this process? And Because, it, I mean, right now, my perception is that, I mean, in general, they think it's good, but... They can tell all sorts of stories about how this doctor did that, and you know they got six minutes with their doctor. And is there any Colorado data that would emphasize a need to change? Or about the patient change? perception of the students? Is that what you're asking? Not the students. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the, oh, outcome, about the, the outcome of the process. One of the hard things about that, from my perspective, is we actually look pretty good in that in the measures that are out there in terms of what patients think about their doctors and their care. And so making the case for change can be harder to say, because we know what you're, what you're getting at. We sort uh -huh. of know it's out there, but if you look at the numbers, it doesn't show up as much. Yeah. And just in response to Jenny's comment, I think it's important to look at the answer to that question from the perspective of all people involved. So the student, the doctor, the patient, and the team. And so um, when we were kind of building our case to our leadership at Kaiser Permanente, we had to try to think about all those different perspectives and how this would model would benefit all of those different players. And I think that's really important as you, um, you know, move forward with trying to develop your elevator speech and mm -hmm. points. It, it's just, it's not only case one player. differs. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great point, Trace. 
Yeah, I'd like to say as a medical student coordinator for the anesthesia program, I feel that it's beneficial because when we have this awesome thing where at the end of each block we do a town hall meeting and the students, it's kind of Vegas rules. So you can just talk <laughs> about the block, talk about what you liked, what you didn't like, and we actually get a lot of feedback from the students that help us implement changes that we need to make to make the program better. And I would like to say that one thing that continually pops up after every block at this town hall meeting is the limited continuity with attendings, residents, PAs, whatever it may be, just because the blocks are shorter. So in certain areas, like for anesthesia, when they go to the U, there are so many attendings, so many residents that there are times where they will work with someone for like a couple hours and they'll never see them again for their two week rotation with anesthesia. So having that continuity, it would, in my opinion, benefit the student drastically just because like I said, every block, we hear that as one of the main complaints is I didn't work with someone like more than this amount of time or I didn't even work with an attending. So just having that longitudinal experience would allow students to have that, which they kind of lack, unfortunately, in just doing a block schedule. Mm -hmm. Powerful session like college is uh, asking patients about uh, their perception of care. We would actually, I'm going to forget the year, um, and even year, I think it was as well. We started with a study that looked at price in the bottom quintile, the top quintile, were looked at because they were positive, which meant when the patients were more satisfied, the quality of their care was worse. The patients who were least satisfied, the quality of their care was best. It was really a huge number of conclusions about price gain and the age gap thereafter. Another way of surveying the quality of the patient's brain um, because of this problem. But they, they were published actually in a kind of obscure journal on the specialty. And they actually asked each other one of their specialty journals on the quality number. So part of the problem has to do with whether the patient's international data is. People are feeling deeply indebted to something that happens to them. They have a lot of difficulty discerning elements um, um, in a global way. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to ask a certain element, like, did somebody explain to you your medication? You need to ask that question, not how, is, how are explanations going to How much do you appreciate the explanation? You have to get that a very specific point that you won't find the problems in the world globally good and not the hospital. So, I'm not deriving the data here. Yeah, no. We have the problem now. Yeah. I will say that there's studies that analyze these patients, um, highly affirmed model, highly affirmed model. There's only a few of them. Um, and, I, and I can tell that I chose the sort of the match the way the data um, are characterized, but it closely goes to the point you raised, which was the patients also value that in their own personal students, continuity with their student, not just a hop in, hop out, just as students value that with their teachers. And we have replicated that here in Colorado. Yeah, I think, do you guys know Ben Smith? Mm -hmm. I do, Fort Collins. Fort Collins. Yeah, he yep. was on our last Yeah, um, he's a five, by the way. I just ran into him last week. <laughs> <laughs> a fantastic doctor, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He trained with you. Yeah. Why, why? He's lovely. So, I tried to just learn one of our, one of the people on the first interview question. I'll see I see one Cambridge is better than one. Um, the then known as Carol McKinsey now known as Carol Luck with the guy on here. Um, oh yeah. And that's just here. Shop shop no one means. So I think there's also this idea that you can find long, long after the program these stories that resonate back to the third year. If you want your stories in my third year, I mine were not shopping. <laughs> and they were they were not like I mean it's not, but they they were they were not like that. So you know, enlisting leader, enthusiastic leaders to drive change is one thing, but when you talk about operationalizing, especially on a larger scale, um, you also need enthusiastic people kind of on the, on the ground. How, how did you approach that? How did that go? Yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't the pyramid scheme, but it had to be honest. 
You started out, what was the scale you started out, and how has it grown? Yeah, it went, it went 6, 8, 12, and then it went 21, and then 13. The, the, and I can tell you why it's not bigger. It's not bigger. The reason it's not bigger uh, has to do with the fact that the funds follow the students, and the big hospitals are not going to, they're not, they're not going to give Cambridge more students. We were, we were loving more students, and the problem for Harvard is it's a side that's a real problem. It's about three or four times as many students seek in the program in our spots. And that causes a lot of grouchiness on the part of students annually. 
Um, there's been, like, in fact, there was a, a large movement for not quite a decade. But they were trying to, to tell students in advance, you really don't want to go there. They were trying to quell the enthusiasm so there wouldn't be oversubscription, rather than just making more spots. Here's your map, but that person's gone. Um, <laughs> current dean, I think, would like to do the whole school, and we'd like to increase Cambridge as well. We have to now do the hard work of this strange thing, which is harder than the hospitals. And they're completely, they're just private entities in, in the community. So the ability for the Harvard Medical School needs to leverage change in hospitals is a much longer process than it would be if we were closer to connection between these. Um, so there are multiple chairs in medicine and multiple chairs of surgery, et cetera, et cetera. So you think of all the disciplines, all the hospitals, all the policies that have to go into that. And that also involves also as well the transfers about research and oh my gosh. So it's been a very long process of trying to build out the openness to increasing the Cambridge and getting allies in other places. Um, the retreat to work on this is on June 10th of the So um, I, I cannot believe I get to come to that so much here in return for that moment of the fall. And I'll shut the network as much as I got. Um, in the end, the 50th little way that I might say this is this educational arguments do not win political values. Political arguments win political Educational data does not win political values. Politics wins political values. That was the start of our work. Last thing I say is until you have the data, people will argue the data, but once you have the data, they'll argue something else. <laughs> right, so there's a little thing to do more on the human domain. It's our job, like whether the program system could follow that. I think this actually is more of a question for our team and for Shanta. Um, as I'm going out and thinking about developing the AMC LICs with Jenny and Eric and everybody else, one of the questions that I have is where are our stakeholders in terms of buy in? Um, Specifically around um, university medicine, because mm -hmm. those are the folks that I'll be working with, mm -hmm. um, or in terms of developing the LICs, but also where are they currently in terms of supporting education and preceptors, because I'm struggling in that round as well as we move towards the LIC. Yeah. So I'm just curious kind of where we are with that. Yeah, I should start with the dean and say I think we have a lot of support. From the dean and that's good for us right if we didn't have a ton of support from him um, it would be much much harder i do think um, strategically having david here is part of solidifying that support with the dean no pressure on you whatsoever <laughs> our entire success of our curriculum to be a light coming from the mountains depends on your visit this week um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I and I think the issue of preceptors um, and numbers and resources, which is time, not just money, um, is a big challenge. Um, we're a big school; our class size is large. Um, there are concerns about that, so I, I don't want to ignore them or say that they don't exist. Um, I would say we're working hard on that too. To say he he and he's invested in saying to the health system, you know. Part of your mission is is related to education and to being tied to us, and how can you be more explicit around that? And I, I think Suzanne and Christy have been doing a lot of work to sort of um, be more transparent and open about what our needs are and also to sell this um, to, to clinicians. Just like students are really awesome advocates um, for some of this work, practitioners who can say, when I had a student, I loved it and it made my life better, and are the ones that we're counting on to try to get that voice um, to kind of come up to the the people who hold the purse strings and the schedules and stuff like that. So the more of you who I know are here because you have had experiences with students in the LIC model or because you want to have more students in the LIC model, the more that you guys can talk about what it felt like for you to have a student in that experience, the better off we're going to be in the in the long run. Um, I'm I'm worried about it. Um, from a logistics and resources perspective, um, but I am com committed to it. And so I think there's a, a lot of the little wins along the way. Um, we've done a ton of work already in sort of making sure that we're celebrating those successes will help us kind of in the long game of it. Um, I'm also okay if it's not perfect um, right away because it won't be. Um, so I've already 
I think getting us to kind of adopt that idea of like, oh, look what we're going towards and look what we're doing um, kind of continuously, I think will be really helpful. Like you'll expose educational needs, you'll expose patient care needs, you'll expose quality and safety. If all of a sudden the stuff is getting become transparent, clear, and that, that's really good, that's how, they, that's how things grow and better. And I think this idea that Jen has been brilliant about sharing with people is that different parts of our health system are valuable in different ways. When I say health system, I mean all of the health systems, <laughs> you know, Kaiser, Denver Health, VA, Children's Hospital, University of Colorado Hospital, you know, our community hospital partners, all of them have different things that are valuable. And so we can capitalize on those characteristics on the ground level. And one of the things that's resonating since most of our department chairs or all of them, I guess, really sit here on the Anschutz campus, what's resonating with them is this opportunity to do the cool thing that they've heard about on Anschutz. Um, and I think that is a surprise, right? We all thought that was going to be really resistant, but the opposite is true. They're excited about it. Um, in particular, highlighting some of the cutting edge stuff that's happening here that makes us a quaternary referral center um, and, and being able to celebrate some of the things that happen here. So I think characterizing our LICs a little bit in the unique places will, will resonate. Students are really excited about Fort Collins, for example, because many of them come from Fort Collins. Um, and so that's a great thing. Um, second trip. Just come visit us in Fort yes, Collins. Yes, come to Fort Collins. We're, we're, we're inviting you right now. Okay. Well, You're invited. You can stay yes. with Ben, I think. He yeah, loves ben, you. Ben, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, side thing. I, I did want to ask, though, so when you just mentioned that, you, that the hospital saw benefits in quality and patient safety, would you be willing to share any of those anecdotes with us, or are they written somewhere? Have you written yeah, them? I, I, yeah. I, I, I go to my computer and I, 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 I Yeah, it's not urgent, but I would yeah. love to see some of those things, because as we sort of develop this elevator speech, those kinds of things would be lovely, very helpful. Okay. Depending on who you're in the elevator with. That's true. That's true. <laughs> It depends on who you're in the elevator with. So for some people, right. this is really important. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, it's a great idea. This thing has happened in the last little while. I just wanted to say that you guys have thought about this interesting. And this is these are spontaneous occurrences. I do want to ask. The sun echoes is clearly not that, but at some point you got to want it, right? So I had this. They don't know my name. Um, Mimi comes up to me randomly. She's from these chats. We have this small chat. And about um, halfway through the chat, she puts her hand on her chest. If you're a, I cannot thank you enough. Full of luck, you get this brother. Remember when we were going to tell you about something else? I think it was a middle account. So that happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chloe, that's the only one chat. Well, something completely different. How does your ass sound? She starts to go on. Guys, we're we're working on trauma informed care together. 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 We're working on trauma informed you're lighting it. And that would be an option that we need to go by the same. I know that I do feel this the same thing because I age by the day and I feel this on the street. It's a fantastic day and not there. It's just not the same. I age. Wow. Love this one. Marish, she says to me, oh, hey, this one's how are you? Is, that, is Christina here? She's good. I'm going to wait for Christina. It's a test day. Patient. Thank you. You see how you were. You really slow down on your chair. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you can say, lady, you just a much better doctor when Christina's here. <laughs> right? So that's the way, though. You, you've heard the story, you've heard the story. You will tell that story uh, all over the place. Like, that, that story is told like, like, a unique story in Australia and North Dakota and Toronto. Like, that story is told again. Yeah, all of us can get into the story of we're better doctors than our students there. We're better doctors than our students there. And none of those things are still as good as those. So we have um, a student named Kat Wakeham. And Kat took care of all patients with cancer throughout an entire year. Because all the students take care of all the patients with cancer for a whole week. And this patient, um, just a patient's 
I know. But that was an extraordinarily bad love year of cancer chemotherapy. Pretty much if you read that chemotherapy, but bad things will happen to you always. We had so many bad things. At some point, we um, we had this get together with the patients and the students were all together, and she asked us to speak. She goes up to her and talk to talk. This quiet woman from Summer Blast, and she says, she goes up and she says, she goes up and she starts to cry. And then her husband starts crying. She couldn't talk. So her husband said, Your husband like holds on to her. He's about to say it. She's like, of course, no one goes like that. She starts meeting that. She starts meeting that. Experience and a big learning experience was kind of harsh. But all of us are tell stories about how meaningful third year was and the things that we would fix. But you just aren't getting stories. You just aren't getting these kind of stories. And the from students that way. But I just want to throw it over them. Again, they're just anecdotes. <laughs> but, but they really are uplifting. They're incredibly uplifting. Um, it's me that I love them because they need to talk about it. I can find the list of the story that's going on. I know. My talk that I gave for 15 years has this picture on them. That's Carol Mason of the University of Colorado. She's back. She's going to kill me. Carol, let it close. Is that her? Are those in your slides from your first talk today? No. no. Okay, I will give you my email address. That'd be awesome. Thanks. Oh, you're going to get them now. Okay. Sorry, Ben. Very good. Well, sir, I'm using these for the All right. Thank you. There was so much media on this thing about the institution. There was so much more media than just the university. We just translated like eight languages. We might have the associated with Esquire. I was going to print newspapers on them. Couldn't read them. We went to America. We went to America. Whoa. Um, some, well, some guy who was like a philosophy professor. Um, <laughs> World War II, I love you. I'm from Pennsylvania. But the chapter is a book about it. But I said, so all of a sudden, that many fingers are getting more part of the regular wonderful features. We're getting more national at the um, So the students from Harvard started to um, choose our references. And it was a lie. There are at least one third year out from Boston where we actually have complete national elements that we know. Students from the country started to know Cambridge. They were just knowing Cambridge. This is the one that is the um, the most absurd. I flew to the UK for a trip and had this like, nice exchange in a public place with someone like, are you going to see them just sitting here at the shoes? I think I've seen that for you before. I met this person, they're like, oh yeah, I think it's really beautiful. I had a lot of good things. Oh my gosh, really? And then I met the, the, um, the carrier that carries me from like, the gate to the airplane in Australia with my wife. A random person in the thing turns me and says, Who oh, am I seeing? My wife just goes, Daddy. Yeah, <laughs> 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 so, like, it became a thing. Like, it just became a thing. People started to hear us. So, people should hear about me. This is absolutely stuff stuff. And it's cool. I know it's exciting to see. They had to stay as a whole. So, we <laughs> like, The oh, world. Obviously, just yeah. another way of making yourself known. So, People started to see faculty positions. That was great. Um, actually, it's interesting. Even people from the tertiary hospitals in Boston who didn't do LICs, people who went through those residencies who didn't do LICs, were not speaking of Cambridge. It's just sort of thinking about Cambridge. Our faculty 
they were great at their level. So we surveyed, one of them one year way at the beginning, we surveyed 72 faculty who were teachers in our department. And the 72 faculty were asked on a, a, a five point, these are simple five point that we said, the faculty that they're teaching in the longitude and particularly the first one around. Or work life is you know, like much worse, worse, neutral, better, much better. Like five point scale. That's that question, and Jess. 68 of the 72 said better or much better, especially 34. 34 said better, 34 said much better. Not your educational teaching, your work life. Two said neutral and two said a little worse. So, of course, since we're self clothing, we can ask those four. <laughs> <laughs> all four of them, all four of them said, uh, independently of each other. You're not going to take me on a program, I'm going to still teach in the program, right? So, what was it that they didn't answer affirmatively? They were, they were caught in this idea that they had to teach the entire canon and turn out all on it, which is not true. Right. But that was a, that was a, that, that stressed all day. Um, and then this is the other thing, but people will keep. So there's a woman from down in China, or these China who have been for eight years here, and an English woman who wants to be a nurse, who wants to be the first LSC in nursing, and herself is going to for five days with us. Someone from the National School of Nursing, who is going to be coming. So um, our faculty are going to spend a little bit to go out with some LICs. So I don't know if that matters, but like, what kind of currency is that? But it really makes me happy for people at our hospital. People are very happy and higher up than the class. I don't want to play it during our class. It's kind of hard to get out On that list, can I ask you if I know we have people who are interested in this question, it's about the resident, so the GME impact, especially around residents as teachers, and how did the move to the LICs benefit or how, what did you do to make sure that that was still something that was valued? Mm -hmm. The conversion was tricky, um, but not for the hospitals. They, the hospitals were delighted, but for the residents, yeah. initially. Not, 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 even, not even for a decade or more now. Right? But initially, their first thought was, as your question implies, is, we're not going to for our students. Mm -hmm. The general happened is, they ended up knowing the students better and more working with them more closely in ways that actually facilitated the resident tax for their lives. So students will arrive, kind of like, I don't know if any of you do that in the hospital's world, but <laughs> they will arrive in, and you know your patient, the patient knows you, you try to, you've got, you've got all this kind of questions from the other part of the world, that show up there. Um, and you're helpful to the team, you're helpful, you can teach on the whole, here and there on the go, you can help answer questions about being confusing, you definitely can be an analyst or, or support for patients. You can pop away where you're going to find the phone and come back later in the day or not. How did you pop in and you have medical ideas, but you're not actually writing orders or anything? You're just there to say to the patient, you know, that's bad, I don't think they're that. No, you say to the nurse patient, I'm like, whatever. Facilitator is the room. The students arrive knowing tons of other patients, and they arrive one in the morning in patient medicine, so they're actually quite excited to be there because they've done a little less of it, so it's more interesting than that. Um, so, residents now see the students as help as notably helpful and notably interested. They're not better than anybody. That's what they ask tours. So yeah, our residents keep clamoring for more, but in the more in, within the model, not more in the whole model. Okay. Yeah, the residents don't refer to the whole model at all. It's too many superficial advantages, but they're not helpful. So they might pull that student aside and also teach them. Oh, not only why, no, they, they do. Yeah, the students don't make other colors. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. And the students also feel incredibly close to the residents. Notably, like this one surgery resident who's been doing um, <coughs> numbers of patients, the students are like, why is this guy? You know, I was teaching our students, the students always know it's not about the case of this designation. They care for them. I would say, that maybe this is a petty way of saying it. There's something incredibly different when it feels like it matters. Like it matters for the student around. Student now, it matters for the student around. It all matters. It matters for the when duty and commitment to drive the learning, it is not the same as my obligation. Of course, I have to ask this guy for one. Do actually want to know? Is that is always the case? No. But it is a general principle that's always duty and commitment to drive the learning. I think what you just said actually made me think of something, which is that um, uh, there are certain students that thrive in LICs, and some perhaps may not. If we go to a model where all we have is LICs, um, how do we support 
all of the students. I think there's two ways people think about this. I'm trying to also offer you to think about like, and knowing what others say to me. I'm trying to postulate you to say stuff, like, I'm trying to offer you to say stuff. There's a lot of people who have like, similar, similar LICs to ours. I have tons of buddies who do rural LICs, and these are just like, the most vulnerable people on Earth. Um, so there's all sorts of LIC folks and types. Like, LICs are quite diverse. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to give an answer that kind of calls from all the clubs, not just like one. Mm -hmm. The two arguments are here are these. One is, is, is there's something there's still something useful to have a mixed model, right? So like UCSF will have like LIC like programs and Frank LICs. Right? <laughs> so they have like block things with lots of longitudinal streams, they're deeply relational and so forth. They have lots and lots of space for LICs and no two months LIC can't get one. And they have diverse LICs so they do guys are in SF Disco, or so the guys are in Oakland, they can do they can do the big tertiary hospital. That's pretty similar, almost one in the DF. So that might be for the DF. So, the DF as well. So, but they still held up having some luck. My view is that they made a way of making that work. My view also is that there's, that they can, that they'll benefit if they can do it with like all of us. And I think that is a person who loves to say that. But that is certainly a thing. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, so lots of LIC elements with some maintained blockishness, and the idea that certain students might have better than that, and then more LIC, so it's not wrong. I think the more, the more helpful argument I've observed or listened to both for rural and urban LICs and community and tertiary LICs would be this one. Um, if you think about what is the stress test a person ought to have, this is going to hard to go to the talk this morning. So, if the stress test were that I'm not naturally good at doing longitudinal relationships, so I have to get challenged to do that, or I'm not good at trying to have a develop a developmental trajectory in my learning, so I have to revisit and grow. If you start thinking about the things that LICs do, they kind of feel like the right stress test. Mm. So if LICs gave the wrong stress test, you that this comment is useless. That would be terrible. You know, like I guess there are data I can show on Friday that will help. I don't know if I want to be together on Friday, but there are data about our LIC that say this. Our students are more hectic and more stressful. So the P of less than 0.05 and a significant high stress. So our students have said that LIC was more hectic and more stressful. And when asked if they were frustrating, our students were equally likely to call it more likely or frustrating, as was the comparison. It did a lot. More hectic, more stressful, equally frustrating. Satisfaction was significantly higher for the PLS than 0.5 on a large effect size, and satisfaction in each of five different domains, like for the role model in the learning environment, for the pathway teaching, the overall experience, not quite that one, but each one independently significant for the large effect size. More confidence building, PLS than 0.5. More meaningful, PLS than 0.5. Um, uh, more humanizing, uh, PLS less than 0.5. Less marginalizing, be of less than 0.5, and more transformational, be of less than 0.5. So, how does that go? More hectic, more stressful, equally frustrating, but all of those things, what's going on? So, I will tell you a little pediatric story, which is that I have twins and a little guy, so I'm all boys. Um, and I, I will tell you that my life would easily be fine as I've been more hectic, <laughs> and more stressful, and more equally more frustrating, right? But definitely, it's more meaningful, more happy. Not my capital card. More meaningful, more transformational, more more loving, more happy. Anything I've done in my life has made more. But it's more hectic and more stressful. So the, the, the message here is uh, the message here is, is that when hectic and stressful and even frustrating are in service of something that is of deep value, that's the right stress test. When hectic and stressful and frustrating are open to the work of the time, that's the wrong stress test. I think we're okay with certain kind of learners and preferred LSE so long as but they're not referring to the right stress. What do you say to people, and, and the dean is going to ask you this too, who say it's beneficial for a future physician to be able to adapt to different environments sure and go from sure. the university hospital to Denver Health to the VA, and if we don't do that, then 
yeah. are we doing them a disservice? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the question about that might be, I think, I think anyone, anyone who I've seen would say this, when you've been transformed, like, 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 but, but for the core formative learning growth, we better have a core formative set of teachers, over students, and for the level guides, sponsors. Right. So yeah, I, I don't even argue, I, I would not argue with LICs throughout all of that school. I would definitely have some kind of lost stuff toward the end of that school. People are already fully formed, and they know who they are, they know the trajectory, they got it. Right. Mm -hmm. The transcendent or sacred skills of doctrine, the core comportment. I would have a set environment that they have to negotiate with and figure out to become part of. And then later, how about people have experiences to get in diversity? I hate to cut off this discussion, but we um, probably need to move you on to your next meeting. <laughs> so. Thank you so much for your time. I think this is a great discussion.